A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had kind of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason, we ended up going up this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go on forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anybody around, but the sun was about to set, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction, and I looked up. Two people were walking, one in front of the other, dressed completely in white, in perfectly clean clothing. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, never acknowledged my mom or I whatsoever, and then walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. What's weird is that neither of them had lights. They were barefoot. They had no belongings with them, and they weren't even dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as I was. She could never see them. I was on edge the rest of the night, and I had a lot of trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I had seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought this was paranormal, he just looked at her and said, Pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. This happened in 2018, in December, just before Christmas. Two of my friends and I, we were 17 at the time, and a cousin of mine who was 15, were camping in the woods. It was on the property of one of the friends that had come along. We were there for five days and pretty much did it all by ourselves, except for water. That we would hike back to the house to grab for the day since it was pretty impractical to get water ourselves for five days. This region was relatively dry, with no water filters or anything like that. We'd lie down pretty early, which felt rather primitive, literally when the sun set. Every night we would hear boar around our tent and steps. Paranoia fueled it a lot, but we had a bow, two axes, and some big knives. One day though, and I think this was either the last night or the second to last, we were just having a chat after dinner, like we would often do, and we hear a scream. It was pretty odd. It didn't sound human, but I have no clue what animal would be doing it either. I know a fair amount of our country's fauna. I've heard a lot of their screams, but this one was just different. The scream sounded like it had a buildup. Not like a scream where you immediately hear the loudest part and then it dies off, but like it started low, got really intense, and then stopped. It sounded far enough, say 50 to 70 meters or so, but then it happens again, and again, and again. Now, suddenly, it's coming from almost all sides, and it was getting pretty close. It didn't sound super menacing, even though we were really scared, shooting my air gun with no rounds just to make a sound. It got to the point where the sound seemed like it was coming right to where the campfire couldn't shed light, just outside of what we could see. I remember that we had set up some traps for rabbits down the trail that day, 
So we gathered all the strength and courage that we could, and we went there. The bait was gone, but the traps were unarmed. And that was a stupid idea anyway. Rabbits don't scream like that. We had some pretty strong flashlights, but we couldn't see a thing. All of a sudden, the sounds just stopped with no clear reason. It was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. And anytime somebody asks me for a scary story, I share this one. Also, where I live in Portugal, we don't have any cougars or anything like that that typically screams. Maybe there's no explanation. I don't know. But all I know is that it terrified me and I still think about it to this day. Okay, so I had this experience a long time ago, and it's been something that has driven me crazy ever since. I need to know if this has happened to anyone else or if anybody knows what it might be. I believe in the paranormal, but I had never heard of anything like this happening to anyone else. So here goes. When I was 10, I was at a friend's house for her birthday party. It was Friday the 13th, but nobody was really that aware of it. Like nobody thought of the date or anything. Anyway, it was a camp out in her backyard which is basically in the middle of the woods. When it comes time to go into the tent and sleep, most of the other girls decide that they would rather sleep inside. Except for me and one other girl, we decided that we wanted to sleep in the tent outside. So the rest of them all slept inside while this other girl and I were outside. The birthday girl's dad slept in a separate tent right next to ours. The girl and I were talking and then, for some random reason, I asked her what the date was. She said, oh, it's Friday the 13th. We both kind of paused for a minute, thinking it over. And we both just kind of said, whatever, that's just a myth. Remember, we were still young, so while we had heard that Friday the 13th was bad luck and stuff like that, we hadn't really seen any scary movies, and we weren't informed about all the bad things that happened on that day. To us, it was a campfire story. Anyway, we don't give it another thought and eventually we go to sleep. This is when things took a turn. I am a very heavy sleeper, but I was woken up in the middle of the night. I have no idea what time it was. We didn't have cell phones yet, but I think it was somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. I woke up because I heard this deep menacing laughter it honestly sounded evil. I sat up and it immediately stopped. I thought I must have just been dreaming, so I went to go lay back down. As soon as my head hits the pillow, it starts again. It's an extremely low man's voice, just going, ha ha ha. I wake up my friend from her deep sleep and ask her if she's hearing it. She sleepily says no. She said she didn't hear anything and she fell right back asleep. I brushed it off once again and once again I tried to go back to sleep. But as soon as I laid my head on the pillow, it started up. I noticed that every time I heard it, it got louder, as if it was getting closer. I tried one more time to go back to sleep, but this time it was so loud it sounded like it was 10 feet away. At this point, I wake up the girl and tell her we're going inside. She's tired, so she said she's gonna stay out there. I wake up my friend's dad from his tent next to ours and I tell him that I wanna go inside. He woke up and escorted me inside where I was finally able to fall back asleep. I tell everyone the next day what happened and they all tell me that I'm crazy. But when I talk to the other girl who was in the tent, she tells me that after I left, she started hearing it too, and that she would swear by it. Whenever I tell people this story, the first thing they say is that it was the dad messing with us, but I'm certain that it wasn't. I knew this guy very well, and he just isn't that type of guy. He's very plain and very quiet. I had known him a long time, 
and I've never seen him act differently. The other reason I know that it's not him is because the entire time it was going on, I could hear him snoring from his tent. So it definitely wasn't him. I've never been able to get that evil laughter out of my head. Ever since that day, I've been afraid of the dark and I've always felt like something is watching me. I suffer from sleep paralysis from time to time now, and whenever I do, I hear the laugh. This was 10 years ago, and it still haunts me. I was in a mountainous recreation area, well after dark, by myself, with no flashlight or camping equipment. I had planned on meditating and fasting all night. At about 10 p.m., I decided that I was hungry, and I started walking down off the ridge that I was on. All of a sudden, there's something big in the darkness. I hear its footsteps in the grass. It sounds very heavy, and very large. I got really scared and I started talking to it, pleading it to leave me alone, that I was just going down the hill and that I just wanted to pass and I didn't want any trouble. I started singing some kind of song and I found two rocks and started banging them together. I made it past the place that I last heard it moving, which was only about 14 feet from me. I heard it shift its weight it was still there, but it didn't walk. The comforting part was that it wasn't moving toward me. The scary part was that all my forceful talking and shouting and noise making hadn't scared it at all. I had to stay close to its position because I was on a steep ridge. Something that wasn't afraid of me out there could only have been a bear or something paranormal. The last I checked, bears don't exactly understand human language and don't negotiate with you if you ask them to let you pass. I don't know. I banged the rocks together all the way down the hill so it could hear me moving away. I'm not really sure what this was, and sometimes I think that I'm just fine never knowing. In the early 90s, my parents sent me to a YMCA summer camp in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It was called something like Matalonike, and it was located on the shores of a series of man-made lakes in Medford Lakes, so not exactly backwoods. We all knew the stories of the Jersey Devil, but the camp had a few of its own ghost stories. The White Lady, said to have jumped off a bridge on her wedding day, and Hatchet Harry, an axe-wielding maniac who got kids that wandered into the woods. I assumed both of these stories were developed to keep kids from wandering off. What I encountered was neither of those. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bunk, hearing some rustling in the bushes. The cabins were basically a half wall with screened windows all around, save for the back wall, with eight bunk beds, four on each side. You could lay in your bunk and look right out the windows. It really sucked though when it rained because there were no shutters to close. I had heard this rustling, so I grabbed my flashlight and I shined it into the bushes from across the front of the cabin, sweeping from bottom to top. There was nothing else in that direction save for woods as our cabin group was right on the edge of the camp. I didn't see anything out there so I put my flashlight back, but kept it next to me and got ready to settle back in. But then this light reappeared. It was this bluish white light and flickered slightly, kind of like a firefly. The light slowly followed the same path that my flashlight had traced from bottom to top, and then it disappeared. It scared the hell out of me, but I didn't bother to wake my grouchy counselor she wouldn't have believed me anyway, since she already thought that I was just a troublemaker. 
So I just smushed down into my sleeping bag and tried to get back to sleep. I never saw it again after that point. My best guess is some sort of firefly that thought my flashlight was a prospective mate, although the fireflies in that area usually had a greenish hue. I've shared this story before, but I've never really gotten a satisfactory response. Maybe I'll never know what that was, and maybe it was something totally natural, but I still thought it was really freaky. I've never really had any paranormal experiences before, but I cannot explain this. I'm in college, and about seven other people and I from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year, and it was cold. Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college-aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places and the energy in this place wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents, and we formed a kind of cluster in this site, with my tent being in the back, so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest, because this backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m., and I wake up to leaves crunching right by my tent. I hear footsteps, walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like it was bipedal. I could not make this up. This creature or thing was circling my tent for a long period of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of the tent and then just stopping for periods of time that seemed like forever. Then it would move on, walking around the rest of our tent cluster. I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth whenever it was close to my tent, like a sort of light heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this went on for hours, and it seemed to me like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow and it didn't move, kind of like a flashlight would if you were holding it still. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe that it was an animal. At some point, probably due to sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling right up until the point that I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it, and my leader admitted that she had heard the footsteps and the noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and that she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in the group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard things about the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned toward Bigfoot because apparently he's associated with light orbs. I've never really been a Bigfoot believer, but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal or person or anything I've ever experienced before. So maybe Bigfoot is as good an explanation as any.
I have been backpacking and camping, mostly solo as an adult, for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings, and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with as little impact as possible. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and the obscure. Cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained fascinate me. I've read most of the missing 411 cases, and I'm a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find, I devour. Anything strange that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I have felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I've been out in the woods, but mostly I've just chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters that other people experience. I always look for logical conclusions first. I even think that David Politis is experiencing some kind of confirmation bias. I don't know that all the missing 411 cases are what he thinks they are. I've never encountered any truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged. And if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you might live, I would suggest it. It's beautiful, serene and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and poplar and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring. I was looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. Eventually, I made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land, with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field means that there had, I guessed at one point, been people living in that area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there, and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up my tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and just look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I had been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together, loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl that I was in, loud enough that you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest, and anyone who's been out there knows that it is dark. I thought it had to be a person making the noise, because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud, and would have taken considerable effort to produce. I had seen no one else at all that day, and the direction from which the sound was coming was the section of old growth that I had explored earlier. And that's it. That's the story. Eventually the sound stopped and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something that I wasn't meant to hear, or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone. Both disturbed me. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen, but nothing ever did. I've told friends about this and they'll either say that it was for sure a Sasquatch or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods late at night, banging logs together in the dark? 
I'm not ready to come to a conclusion. Like I said, I'm a skeptic. But I'll admit that I have no idea how to explain what I heard that night. A few years back, I went camping with two buddies in the mountains near Lake Tahoe. We hiked about two hours with our packs to a small lake and set up camp. All was normal during the day. We made some hot dogs and beans and then stayed up until it was dark to watch the stars. Once it was dark out, we hiked up to the top of a large boulder to get a vantage point to see the stars over the trees. I recall that there was no moon out that night because we could see the stars so clearly due to the limited ambient light. We were pretty far out there, so there was no background noise or light from humans. Once our eyes adjusted after a half an hour or so, we could see all of the stars and even some satellites slowly moving in the sky. After we're done stargazing, we head down to our tents that were set up right by the lake. We have two two-person tents for the three of us. My two friends shared one tent and I was alone in the other. We set up the tents right next to each other on the same flat spot. I fall asleep pretty easily because I was tired from hiking and exploring all day and because it was so dark out and I like sleeping in the dark. However, at about three or four in the morning, I wake up to a rustling on the outside of my tent. In my half-asleep days, I'm not sure if it's just wind or something else. I keep listening, and I realize that it's something brushing against my tent. It sounds like an animal pushing its nose against the tent fabric and sniffing. The sound is coming from the side of the tent, right next to my head, so I can hear it super clearly. At this point, my heart is racing, and I'm lying frozen in my sleeping bag, hoping that whatever is outside will leave my tent and it'll just be over. I think about calling out to my friends in their tent, but I don't want to startle or anger whatever is outside, so I decide to just keep lying still and hope it will leave. My mind is going through every possibility when I finally realize what it is. When we had set up our tents earlier that day, there wasn't much flat space, so we placed our tents very close to each other like I said. Evidently, they were so close that when my friend was moving his feet in his sleeping bag, they brushed up against his tent, which was right near my head. So all along, it was my friend's feet moving around, and there was no animal or person outside. Phew. However, that wasn't the end of the weird stuff. And I only realized that this next part was weird once we had left the next day and I got home. As I laid in my tent and tried to slow my heart after realizing that the rustling was my friend, I was looking at the shadows of the trees on the wall of my tent. They reminded me of when I was a kid, when a car would slowly drive down your street and the headlights through the blinds would cast shadows that slowly draw across the ceiling. At the time, it made sense to me, and I thought it was just like when I was a kid. Considering that I had just thought a creature was outside my tent, this seemed like nothing. However, as I mentioned earlier, it was a moonless, pitch-dark night. So what could that light have been? It was a very slow-drawing light, that had the shadows of the trees moving across my tent walls for about five minutes. We were very far from civilization, so there's no way that it was a car or a flashlight from a midnight hiker, because the light was so steady and slow moving. I don't know if it was a flare or a comet streaking across the dark sky or something else. I still don't know what it could have been, and I think maybe I'm okay with that.
This was when I was around 14, so about 2002. My cousin and I went camping behind my grandparents' house, about a half mile into the woods in northeastern Texas. We were just in our small tent, watching a movie on a portable DVD player. It was probably one in the morning, when suddenly something, or things, started rapidly running around our tent. Whatever it was kept pushing in at the top of the tent with their hands, and then running circles around the tent. It wasn't like they were trying to damage the tent, but like they were trying to scare us. We tried to rationalize what this could have been. It lasted about one or two minutes. We didn't hear any animal noises, but we did hear footsteps going around the tent. The height of the tent and the hands just made it seem like it was little kids doing it. We were scared shitless and made no noise the rest of the night. We went back home after sunrise. No children should have been out there. It wouldn't have been any of the family members. And it would just be a really odd thing to do if it was just random people. It's not really a place that people camp at, either. If anyone can offer any thoughts on what this might be, I would really appreciate it. It's been a heavy weight on us, and we've racked our brains to figure out what it could have been ever since. A few years ago, this girl that I liked and I went out one night. We were having a really fun time just goofing around. We bought some snacks and drinks and just wanted to find a spot to sit. It was kind of romantic because it was quiet and it was quite chilly out. We didn't pay much attention to that, as though each other's company was helping us keep warm enough, you know? Anyway. We see a cemetery, and although it's already past closing time, the front gate is open. We decided to go inside, as it was a place that we could have some privacy. We walk through the cemetery for a minute or so, and we see a bench to sit at. It's right by another gate, but that one was locked. We sit and talk and laugh, and then something pretty off-putting happens. On the other side of the cemetery, I see a white, almost transparent something rush by, disappearing behind a mausoleum. I told her about it, and she looked back as she had her back turned to that direction. We waited, and the cold began to kick in a little. She told me that she didn't doubt it. We were probably disturbing the dead, and there was probably a reason for the closing time other than routine maintenance. After that, we tried to exit the cemetery through the way that we had gotten in, but it was already locked. We were a little bit worried, but we were also kind of enjoying ourselves, as the situation was harmless. We didn't see anything after that, and just climbed over the gate next to the bench. This experience, not being the most clear one, only added to my already existing belief of the world that we choose to look away from every day. I care for my niece full time, so she's like a daughter to me. She's done some peculiar things over the years but here are a few that stand out. Once, when she was still a toddler, I was roused from sleep by the sensation of my hair being brushed. As I opened my eyes, she simply whispered, shh, and attempted to close my eyelids, much like one might do for the deceased. On another occasion, when she was feeling under the weather, we lay in bed watching a movie. Out of the blue, amid the film, she warned, Don't let your feet hang off the bed like that. The devil can grab you and pull you to hell. Given she's only five, I can only hope that she overheard that from another child at school. At least I hope so. And lastly, as I was preparing dinner one evening, she strolled nonchalantly through the kitchen and said, 
I'll get you, and I'll make it look like a bloody accident. It terrified me at the moment, but I later discovered that she had lifted the line from Cat in the Hat. She's a great kid, but she has definitely given me some spooks a time or two. I live near Mount Hope Cemetery. It's the very same one that Stephen King mentions in his books, and the one that he cameos in in Pet Cemetery. Day and night, Mount Hope Cemetery is always unsettling. Every time I pass by it, I always feel like I'm being watched. Most of the time it's an easy feeling to brush off, but there are three instances where I've been shook to the core. First. I was in the fourth grade. My whole class went on a field trip to the cemetery. From the very beginning when it was brought up, I expressed my lack of interest in going, but I was the only one not showing enthusiasm, so I knew then it was going to happen. I dreaded it, hoping that my teacher would decide to cancel the trip. I wasn't allowed to skip school as a kid, so I never even asked. I went to the cemetery with my class, and they were all having a wonderful time. I was immersed in vibes that were making me sick to my stomach. We were told to make rubbings on paper with crayon of at least three gravestones that caught our eye. I didn't want to, but I did anyway. While I'm rubbing these gravestones, I felt like I was stepping on the toes of someone and that I was bothering someone. I managed to rub two, the third I picked. My crayon was still in my left hand. I grabbed a piece of paper from the pile near me, but when I knelt down to begin rubbing it, I had an overwhelming feeling of anger wash over me. I stopped dead. For a second, I couldn't move. That gravestone didn't want to be rubbed. I tried to talk myself into reason. It's a 117-year-old rotted corpse. It can't possibly do anything. But to no avail, I could have forced myself to rub this one, but I thought that that wasn't best. I didn't rub a third one. I just couldn't get myself to do it. It freaked me out. I said it out loud to nobody in particular. There's something wrong with this grave. It doesn't... I stopped talking. I wasn't really comfortable talking about the experience to anyone around me. I knew that they wouldn't have believed me anyway. I know what I felt, and it wasn't peaceful. If I had rubbed that grave, someone, or something, would have attached itself to me, and it would have been nearly impossible to shake off. It was in the summer of 2012. I biked home from work. I worked at Wendy's. The cemetery was on my right. I looked because I saw somebody. I thought it was just a dumb teenager doing something stupid, but it wasn't. I saw two shadows watching me, one looming over a grave. It had long, creepy fingers and a thick, dark, malevolent energy that seemed so bent on anger and misery that it must have been an entity of pure evil. The other was a man, a shadow, standing right next to it. It was standing next to a thick tree. His top hat brim remained straight, even though as close as he was to that tree, the tree would have bent the brim. He must have been seven feet tall. The looming one lunged toward me. I yelled an expletive, completely sure that I was about to get possessed. The akimbo one flinched, and then they were both gone. I was still myself and relieved, heart pounding, but I was okay. The third. I was biking home again through Mount Hope Avenue. I almost got through the cemetery without seeing anything. Then, suddenly, two lights caught my attention. They were moving crazy fast. One was chasing the other. They crossed the road in front of me. The one lagging behind suddenly pounced. They let go. They both darted past the road and onto the other side. The moment they began getting smaller, they were gone. 
Of course, there are times when I can't avoid going past Mount Hope Cemetery. I have sensed other spirits and the like. I just completely downright refuse to acknowledge them. There's definitely something sinister about the cemetery, and part of me feels like there might be something that wants to latch on to me there. One day, I decided to go to an old cemetery in San Diego, California, in a town called Julian. This town was home to gold miners and citizens that built the town. The average year on the tombstone was 17 to 1800s, some ranging into 2000 to 2008. We went out there around the time of 12 p.m., just going around asking basic questions of anything that might be there. I stumbled on a gated burial dating 1825. I asked if he was there while someone was taking a video and pictures. All of a sudden, I got so tired and drained that I felt like we had to go. I felt like I was being attacked. When we got to the car, we reviewed the photos first. What I saw was disturbing. White, blue, and green lights flying all around me. Listening to the audio was even scarier. I heard an old man with a deep crackly voice laughing and saying Marissa, and then I heard growling noises. I asked to leave immediately after hearing this. We were driving away, and about a half mile to a mile out, our car started doing really frightening stuff. The radio would turn on and off, headlights would stop working, our mirrors kept moving dramatically. The lights in the car were turning on and off. We pulled over, we were so scared. Eventually it stopped and we drove off, scared and confused as to what had just happened. When we arrived home, we could hear voices and banging in the house. We didn't sleep at all that night. I never did return, and until this day, eight years later, I can still hear that voice, and I hate driving by that cemetery. I am of Japanese descent, and each year, I go visit my family in the north of Japan. I also do the Obon, which is basically like the Japanese version of Dia de los Muertes, when all of the spirits of the dead come visit the land of the living. During this period, I decided to go visit Kyoto. After walking for a while out of the city, I began climbing a nearby mountain to discover a substantially sized cemetery. Being a young lad of 16 at the time, I decided that I would go exploring and see which families are interred here. It was about 3 p.m. and it was scorching. The trees here and there in the cemetery bore a welcome shade for me to cool down a little. After about 10 minutes or so of looking around the very old stone slabs, I realized a few odd details. First, it seems I somehow got lost in the cemetery. Mind you, I have an excellent sense of geolocation, and I've found my way out of many a forest, mountains, crowded airports, and such. The cemetery itself was lower in its middle part, and surrounded by woods, so I think it was in the lower part because the horizon was only tombstones. Second, it was getting dark. As I said before, it was around 3 p.m., so that was very odd, and the surroundings had that yellowish tinge you get at dusk. To make a small cultural parenthetical remark here, dusk in Old Japanese is called tasogare doki, and it's supposed to be the in-between moment when strange things occur. Not a good time to be surrounded by tombs. Third, I was getting a little cold. Not like I was plunged in an icy pool, but more like when you're in the middle of the mountains and you can feel some coldness through the gaps of your coat. After that, 
I began to see some weird shadows, or something, out of the corner of my eye. Very weird, because I wasn't feeling panicked or anything yet. I could calmly observe them. It was moving like these old lava lamps, very deliberately, and sometimes looked a bit human-shaped, or like huge faces. I was walking toward it, because I thought that if it could harm me physically, I could certainly punch it, right? But it was like a mirage, like it was fluttering. After a while, I started to feel like I was in real danger. I was getting colder and colder, and at this moment I saw a monk who was very surprised to see me there, because the cemetery was supposed to be closed at this hour. He brought me back to the entrance, and I told him that it was open when I got there. He informed me that he was next to it all day, and he never saw me pass by. I assumed that he thought I went in by a fraction, so I told him everything that I saw and felt. He seemed very surprised at first, and then he told me to look at the hour. It was 6.10 p.m. That means I was in there for over three hours. He then told me that I shouldn't come here while the sun is setting, because I could have been taken away by the Kamikakoushi. Anyway, that was my very weird experience there. The cemetery was east of Kyoto, near the Shogunzuka mountain. I'd be interested to know if anybody else has had strange experiences there. When this happened to me, I was so young that I actually don't remember all of it, but I have heard all of it secondhand so many times that I know the story. The last time it happened with this particular ghost is actually my earliest memory. So when I was little, the very first house I lived in as a baby was this old 18th century townhouse that my parents rented from the local doctor. Suffice it to say, that place was super haunted. It's a story for another day, but three years ago, they finally sealed the upper floors off entirely, and the doctor told my mom that nobody will ever set foot up there again. The bottom floor is now the GP office and waiting room. All of this aside, growing up in that environment left me with a major sensitivity to spirits that is kind of still active sometimes, even though I'm 25 now. But when I was a kid, I terrified my entire extended family with the things that I would come out and say at random. Anyway, one of the more popular stories that my parents like to tell at barbecues and parties and really to anybody who will listen, happened when I was two and my mom wanted to pop in to visit her grandfather's grave. Her family is from a village about a 20 minutes drive away, and there are two graveyards, the new one and the old one. My grandfather is buried in the old one in the old family plot. This graveyard has since been locked, and you have to get a key from the priest to get in. So, being two, I wasn't overly interested in sitting down by a graveside to pray with my parents and they were happy enough to let me wander so long as I stayed in their sight, and luckily for them, I didn't go far. I bolted down the path and stopped, about halfway back among the tombstones, where I started to sort of sway on the spot and dance as much as a two-year-old is capable of. My parents watched me for a few minutes, but didn't think much of it, and then told me that we were leaving. My dad picked me up and we headed for the gate, but just before we left, I turned over his shoulder, looked around, and smiled and waved at something. They obviously didn't really think it was anything to be concerned about, because a week later they went back. My grandfather had died the day before their wedding four years earlier, and mom had been very close to him, so they visited very often. This time, when we went in, I didn't even wait for permission, 
and ran back down to the same graveside where I began swaying on the spot again, looking up over the grave in the air as if something was suspended there. It's probably worth describing the grave, but there really isn't much to describe. It was a very small patch of earth that didn't even have a border, fairly overgrown, and with a totally rusted small iron cross at the head of it. There was no nameplate, no indication of who was buried there, and it clearly wasn't a recent grave. Keep in mind, literally nobody is buried in this cemetery anymore except a couple more of my family members who went into the family plot. At this point, my parents are creeped out. My dad, who swears blind that he doesn't believe in ghosts and never will, came down to ask me what I was doing. I explained that I was dancing. He asked me why, and I pointed above the iron cross and, in the jumbled English of a toddler, said, The boy is singing and he wants me to dance. My dad picked me up, ran past my mother, and got into the car to wait for mom. They went to my great-grandmother's house across the street and told her the whole story, but they all agreed it sounded a bit more ridiculous the more they thought about it, and since I was only two, it was probably just me playing a game with myself to keep myself entertained. So they went back. They entered through different gates. They went over the wall. No matter what they did to try to confuse two-year-old me, I always went back to the same grave. And once again, there was nothing special about it. It wasn't beautiful or impressive. There was no reason for a two-year-old to be so drawn to this little patch of earth. But I always went straight there. I always danced while he sang to me, and I always waved to him before I left regardless of which side we left from or which winding pathway they took out of there. They brought other family members with them as witnesses. They had family friends question me about it, and I always told the same story. My earliest memory is of my grandmother sitting me down on the cemetery wall while I was trying to dance as instructed, while my parents looked at me, totally scared, and asked me to describe him or tell her what his name was. I don't think I answered her, but I remember finding the looks on their faces just so unbelievably funny because they were so afraid of my friend, who only wanted to sing to me. What I didn't know was that my great-grandmother had told the priest, brought him in there to show him the grave, and asked if there was any way to know who was buried in the little unmarked plot. He went off and checked the burial records, and, sure enough, Five-year-old Robert, the blacksmith's son, had died of tuberculosis nearly a century earlier and lay there, marked only by the little iron cross that his father had made for him. Funny enough, my great-grandmother knew the blacksmith. He was their next-door neighbor, but he was an old man when she was a little girl, so she never knew the boy. My parents stopped bringing me to see my friend after that, we only went into the cemetery for funerals. We also moved out of the doctor's house, but it was a few years before I stopped being a creepy little kid that terrified anybody that spoke to me. I actually did go back a couple of years ago, and I brought a friend of mine visiting Europe from Boston. She told me when we met that she could speak to ghosts, and after a couple of weeks, I started divulging the hundreds of stories I have from childhood. She asked if she could come to the cemetery with me. Since the gate was locked, we had to hop the wall, but once we were inside, she pointed clean across the top of the headstones and said, Hey, is it that one over there? Pointing at its location. I nodded and she started walking toward it and stopped right at the iron cross. It's this one, right? I nodded. I swear this is totally real. She stood there for a second, and then she started backing away. I didn't have to ask her why. It was in the middle of December, and yet the air seemed to fizzle and get really hot. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end, and the pressure that built up in my head made it feel like my scalp would split open. 
She told me she wanted to leave, but I was already running out of there at that point, and we vaulted the wall like Olympians. I don't know what happened that day, since I'm not a child anymore and didn't really see anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling afterward that my little friend there felt like I had brought her with me so that I could impress her, and that he didn't like that. Not at all. The North Sea was known for its treacherous waters and unpredictable weather, but for us sailors, it was also a source of livelihood. Our ship was a sturdy vessel that had seen many voyages, but nothing could have prepared us for that day. The morning started off calm, the sea reflecting the pale blue of the sky. We were making good time, the wind filling our sails as we navigated through familiar waters. But as the day wore on, a sense of unease settled over the crew. The waters grew darker, and the air became thick with tension. Whispers among the crew spoke of ancient legends, tales of a monstrous creature that lurked in the depths, waiting for its next victim. I dismissed these as mere superstitions, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that we were being watched. As evening approached, the waters began to churn. Massive waves rocked our ship, and a deep rumbling echoed from the depths below. And then, without warning, they appeared. Massive tentacles, each one the size of a ship's mast, rose from the water, reaching for the sky. The crew was thrown into chaos. Men shouted orders, trying to navigate away from the looming threat. But it was too late. The tentacles wrapped around our ship, pulling it closer to the abyss. The wood creaked and groaned under the immense pressure, and I could hear the terrified screams of my crewmates. I clung to the mast, my eyes fixed on the monstrous appendages that threatened to pull us under. And then, from the depths, it emerged. A colossal eye, black and unblinking, stared at us its gaze filled with ancient malice. The world seemed to stand still in that moment. Time lost all meaning as we were held in the Kraken's grasp. And then, as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature released us, the tentacles retracted into the depths, and the sea calmed once more. We were left adrift, our ship damaged but still afloat. The crew was shaken, many injured, but miraculously, everybody was alive. For some reason, we had faced the Kraken and lived to tell the tale. The rest of our journey was a blur. We made our way back to port, our ship a testament to our harrowing encounter. Many dismissed our tales as the rambling of traumatized sailors, but we knew the truth. The North Sea still calls to us, its waters filled with promise and peril. But we sail with caution, always aware of the ancient terror that lurks below, waiting for its next prey. At the time this happened, I had recently discovered I was pregnant and the stress was mounting. The pregnancy was unexpected, and I was apprehensive about breaking the news to the father, who happened to be my best friend's brother. One day, as I sat with my best friend in her room, her three-year-old daughter wandered in. I held back from discussing my situation in the child's presence, fearing she might inadvertently relay the news to her uncle. Opting for silence, I lay down on the bed. The little girl approached and gently placed her hand on my belly. She offered a reassuring smile and said, everything is going to be okay, before softly rubbing my abdomen. My friend and I exchanged bewildered glances. We were certain that the child had not overheard our conversation. Her room is upstairs, 
and she always needed supervision while climbing the steps, signaling her approach. To this day, I don't know if it was a weird coincidence or if that little girl knew something. I haven't yet become a parent, but an incident involving my younger brother still unnerves me. When he was about three years old, a chilling episode took place. My mother, overseeing my two younger brothers' bath, shouted for me to fetch a towel, allowing her to maintain her watchful gaze on them. As I was about to hand over the towel, my typically incoherent speaking toddler brother abruptly sat upright. He tilted his head and, with an uncharacteristic clarity, declared, Look, Mom, I can't die. Without hesitation, he crossed his arms over his chest and slid under the water. Both my mother and I were momentarily stunned, but she swiftly plucked him out of the tub. Though he had swallowed a lot of water and was sobbing, he emerged relatively unharmed. Several years later, as we replaced the trim in my brother's room, adjacent to that very bathroom, we discovered a penciled height chart concealed behind the closet trim that connected to my parents' bedroom. The chart documented the growth of a child named Alan until the age of five. The elderly woman who had sold us the house had frequently claimed that she and her husband were the original homeowners and that they never had children. Driven by curiosity, we decided to investigate the home's history. The local library's newspaper archives unearthed a 1950s article revealing that the old couple did, in fact, have a child. Tragically, he had drowned in the same bathtub after presumably standing, slipping, and then striking his head. His name was Alan. After unearthing this connection, I could no longer bring myself to enter that bathroom, and it still unnerves me to this day. I had dreamed of this moment ever since I was a child. The chance to finally see the legendary Loch Ness Monster with my own eyes. And now, here I stood on the pebbled shores of the iconic Loch Ness, wrapped in an early morning mist that curled off the glassy water. I had risen hours before dawn, too anxious and excited to sleep through the night before my long-awaited quest. As the first rays of sun peeked over the rolling green hills, I scanned the expansive loch with a bated breath. A quiet stillness hung in the air, interrupted only by the occasional lap of water against the rocks. And then, suddenly, a great rush of movement. A flock of birds erupted from the trees, squawking in panic. My pulse quickened, and I stared intently at the spot where they had taken flight. Had something disturbed them below the surface? Churning water appeared, too forceful to be caused by any ordinary fish or eel. My heart pounded as the massive shape of some underwater creature twisted just below the water's surface. Its immense serpentine body, undulated with surprising grace given its enormous size, I could scarcely believe my eyes, overwhelmed by the ancient beast of legend and lore coming to life before me. Slowly, carefully, the creature turned toward the shore where I stood, immobilized in awe. As it approached, its details came into focus, a long arched neck extending from its body, the head small and rounded compared to its girth. Sunlight glittered off dark scales in hues of green and steel gray. Though terrified, I also felt profound privilege to encounter this mythic animal in the flesh. The massive head rose from the water, beady eyes locking onto mine briefly, as if taking stock of who had intruded upon its ancient realm. 
I dared not move a muscle, feeling as though I was glimpsing a piece of the past, a creature that time had forgotten. With a powerful flick of its muscular tail, the monster slowly submerged again into the loch's shadowy depths. I lingered long after it had gone, overwhelmed and hoping to catch one last look. Though the beast did not resurface, I knew that I would treasure that magical moment on the shore forever. The Loch Ness Monster was real, and I felt honored to have seen it, if only for a moment. When I was 17, I'm 24 now, I visited a cemetery at night with a small group of friends. We were just going to look at the graves, give a little love to the graves that looked like maybe nobody visited them anymore because they were from so long ago, and things like that. We were not going there to hurt anything, or mess around, or be disrespectful, because we were, and most of us still are, very spiritual. I had always liked cemeteries, and I feel a kind of peace when I'm in one, so I was very comfortable and relaxed there. I think that may be why what happened happened at all. I was following near the back of the group, lingering on some graves to read what was written, when everything just goes blank for me. The rest of what happens is what my friends told me about hours later. Hey, 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 this one's mine. I called to the next nearest people in the group. He turned around to laugh and tell me to quit playing around when he stopped. I shouldn't have died. Really, it wasn't my fault. Wh what do you mean? He asked, getting my other friends to stop and walk back to me. Well, you see, I was playing in the barn with the kittens and the man came in with a gun and bang. I don't think they would have believed that I wasn't the one speaking if the voice coming out of me hadn't been so much higher pitched and had a very, very country accent. I don't know why he did it, he was my daddy's best friend. For the next two hours, I led them around the cemetery pointing out graves and telling them about the people buried there like I knew them. One of my friends had her phone out to use as a flashlight. She recorded everything I was saying so that they could fact check when we went back to the house that we were staying at. Eventually, I stopped again, frowning at a headstone. This one's my brother. He got to live a long, long time. It's not fair. I wanted to live too, I said, stomping my foot just before collapsing on the ground. I didn't wake up until we got home that night, and I remember that I had the worst headache of my entire life. My friends showed me the video, and then we all looked up as much as we could on the internet to see if I had been right. The grave that I had collapsed on top of had not been the brother of the girl who had supposedly possessed me. He had been the son of her father's best friend. The same best friend, who she said shot her. I've never been back to that cemetery since. I'm afraid that the little girl won't be the one to possess me next time. Unfortunately, my friend's phone is the one that had the video, and she doesn't have that phone anymore. We didn't really think to save it after we did our fact check. You can believe whatever you want, but everything that I told you is the truth. I've never been back to that cemetery since. I'm afraid that the next time, the little girl won't be the one to possess me. The old clock on the barn wall clanged midnight, just as I hauled the last musty bale up into the hayloft. I paused to wipe beads of sweat off my brow and take a deep, satisfying breath. The worn wooden walls creaked gently in the night breeze, mingling with the faint moos of Bessie settling down for bed. Outside, the farm was swallowed by inky darkness. Not even starlight pierced through the blanket of clouds tonight. 
After latching the heavy barn doors, I headed back home, anxious to put my feet up. But a prickle shivered up my spine before I had gone even 20 paces. Something in the air felt off. The hairs on my neck stood at attention. The farm was as silent as a graveyard, not even the whisper of the wind through the cornfields. I froze in my tracks at the sound of panicked bleeding near the pasture. Old Margaret, the sheep, crying for help. I grabbed my flashlight and sprinted over, sweeping the feeble light across the field. It glinted off glassy eyes and tousled wool as the sheep bumped each other in distress. There, the light fixed on a horror hovered over Margaret's limp body. My heart seized at the sight of its emaciated frame, nothing but leathery hide clinging to jagged bones, coarse fur sprouting in mangy patches across its haggard body. But most terrifying was the row of spikes jutting from its arched, snarling back. The creature's head snapped toward me, glowing crimson eyes meeting mine. Blood dripped from jagged fangs bared in a gruesome sneer. Every childhood nightmare about the chupacabra sprang to life before my eyes. I stumbled back as it unleashed an ungodly screech that rattled my bones. Those hellish eyes bored into mine a moment more, and then the beast disappeared like a wisp of smoke into the darkness between heartbeats. I ran to Margaret, but it was too late. Her wool was matted with blood where the chupacabra had fed. Childhood myths warped into flesh and blood before my eyes, into razor fangs that had claimed another innocent life under the cloak of night. The Slavic woods have always been a place of mystery and folklore. As a child, my grandmother would tell me tales of creatures and spirits that dwelled within its depths. But the one story that always sent shivers down my spine was that of Baba Yaga. One summer, driven by youthful curiosity and a touch of bravado, I decided to venture deep into the woods to see if the legends were true. I had heard whispers of a peculiar hut that stood on chicken legs, and I was determined to find it. After days of wandering, I stumbled upon a clearing. In its center stood a wooden hut, its architecture bizarre and unsettling. It stood on two massive chicken legs, and as I approached, the hut began to spin, its windows and doors shifting and changing places. Gathering my courage, I called out, Hut, hut, turn your back to the forest and your front to me. To my astonishment, the hut obeyed, setting down with its door facing me. I cautiously stepped inside and was met with an even stranger sight. The interior was filled with odd trinkets and herbs hanging from the ceiling, and there in the center of the room sat an old crone, her skin wrinkled and her teeth made of iron. It was Baba Yaga. She looked me up and down, her gaze sharp and calculating. What brings a young one like you to my abode? She cackled. Swallowing my fear, I replied, I wanted to see if the legends were true. Baba Yaga laughed, a sound that was both eerie and mesmerizing. You have spirit, she said. But be warned. Not all who enter my hut leave unscathed. We spoke for what felt like hours. She told me tales of the forest, of its spirits and creatures, and of her own ancient powers. I listened, captivated by her stories and the world she painted. As dawn approached, Baba Yaga looked out of her window. It's time for you to leave, she said, her voice softer now. But remember... The woods are a place of magic and mystery. Respect them, and they will respect you. I nodded, thanking her for her wisdom. As I stepped out of the hut, it began to spin once more. 
and when I looked back, it had vanished, leaving only the whispering trees behind. I returned to my village with a newfound respect for the legends of my people. Baba Yaga, the fearsome witch of the woods, had shown me a glimpse of a world beyond our understanding, a world where magic and reality intertwine. Algonquin Park in Ontario was a place of solace for me. As a child, my family would often visit, and I would lose myself in the vastness of its woods. As an adult, I continued the tradition, often taking solo trips to reconnect with nature. But one autumn trip shifted my perspective forever. I had planned a five-day hike, charting a course that would take me through some of the park's less traveled areas. The first couple of days were peaceful, filled with the vibrant colors of fall and the gentle sounds of the forest. On the third day, as I was making my way through a particularly dense section of woods, I began to hear it, a soft, rhythmic crunching of leaves. At first, I thought it was just the wind or perhaps a small animal, but as the hours went on, the sound persisted, always behind me always just out of sight. That evening, as I set up camp near a quiet stream, I caught a fleeting glimpse of something in the periphery of my vision. A large figure, covered in fur, moving swiftly between the trees. I tried to dismiss it as a trick of the light, or perhaps fatigue playing tricks on my mind. But as night fell, the sounds grew closer. The once gentle crunching of leaves now felt ominous, echoing through the stillness of the night. I lay in my tent, flashlight in hand, listening intently. Every so often, I would hear a soft grunt or a low growl, sending shivers down my spine. In the early hours of the morning, curiosity overcame fear. I cautiously unzipped my tent and peered out. The moon was high in the sky, casting a silvery glow over the forest. And there, on the edge of the clearing, stood a massive creature, its fur glistening in the moonlight. It looked at me with curious eyes, its gaze neither threatening nor friendly, just observing. We locked eyes for what felt like an eternity. And then, with a grace that belied its size, it turned and disappeared into the woods. The next day, I found large footprints near my campsite confirming that my encounter had been real. I decided to cut my trip short, feeling both awed and unnerved by what I had witnessed. As I made my way back to the park's entrance, I crossed paths with an elder from a local tribe. I shared my experience, and he listened intently. He spoke of the Sasquatch, a guardian of the woods, a creature that his people had known of for generations. He told me I was fortunate that such encounters were rare and were often seen as a sign, a reminder that we are but guests in these ancient woods, and there are beings far older and more mysterious than us that call it home. I left Algonquin Park with a newfound respect for its mysteries. The vast forests, with their towering trees and hidden trails, were more than just a place of beauty. They were a realm where legends walked, always one step ahead always watching. The ancient ruins of Delphi perched high on the slopes of Mount Parnassus have long been a place of pilgrimage and wonder. Known as the center of the world in ancient Greek religion, it was said to be protected not just by the gods, but by creatures of majestic power, the griffins. I had always been fascinated by Greek mythology and the tales of these magnificent beings with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. They were among my favorite stories. 
So when an opportunity arose to join an archaeological expedition to Delphi, I left at the chance. Our team was searching for remnants of ancient rituals and artifacts. Days turned into weeks, and while we uncovered many fascinating relics, there was no sign of the griffins. That was until one evening, as the sun cast a golden hue over the ruins. I had wandered away from the main excavation site and found myself in a secluded grove. In its center stood a stone pedestal, and atop it, a gleaming golden object. As I approached, I realized it was a beautifully crafted beak, sharp and gleaming like a sword. Suddenly, a shadow passed overhead. I looked up to see two massive griffins, their golden beaks matching the one on the pedestal, circling above. Their eyes, fierce and proud, locked on to mine, and for a moment, I felt the weight of their scrutiny, as if they were assessing my very soul. With a powerful flap of their wings, they descended, landing gracefully on either side of the pedestal. They regarded me with a mix of curiosity and caution, their majestic presence filling the grove. I slowly approached the pedestal, placing my hand on the golden beak. A rush of images flooded my mind, rituals, ceremonies, and the griffins standing guard, protecting the sacred site and its treasures from invaders. As the vision faded, I found myself back in the grove, the griffins still watching me. With a nod of their heads, as if acknowledging a shared understanding, they spread their wings and soared into the sky, disappearing into the setting sun. I returned to the camp, the golden beak in hand, and shared my encounter with the team. While many were skeptical, our lead archaeologist, well versed in the myths, believed. He spoke of the griffins as guardians, protectors of the divine and the sacred. The discovery of the beak was hailed as a significant find, a tangible link to the legends of old. But for me, it was more than just an artifact. It was a reminder of the magic and mystery that still dwells in our world, guarded by beings of ancient power and majesty. This happened a few years ago, but now it came back to my memory because of something I read recently. At the time of this, I was working for a private security company, and we were working at an event at Carisbrook Castle on the Isle of Wight. There were probably 10 to 15 of us scattered across the darkened castle in winter. It was really early in the morning, probably about 1 to 2 a.m., and a colleague and I picked the short straw of doing perimeter walk, where there is no light, not even from streetlights nearby. So we have to do laps of the entire castle along the wall with the moat on our right-hand side in near darkness, bar the torches that we were allowed to carry. As we approached our second lap near the longest stretch of the wall, I noticed footsteps in the darkness that weren't ours. We stopped a few times to check out this noise, but we could never pin it down to anything. It could have been an animal moving in the darkness, I suppose, but it just sounded strange. The next thing happened all within a few seconds, not really fast enough for us to respond. In the darkness, I noticed a figure of a man walking toward me. He was walking up from the moat to the right of us. As he approached, he said something along the lines of, Right Greeley then walked straight past us into the solid 12-foot rock wall. In a complete state of shock, my colleague and I just confirmed with each other what we'd seen, that somebody had walked into a solid wall and vanished. Not gone over, not walked past, but walked directly into. We raised the alarm for an intruder just in case, but after a site-wide search, we never found anything of this guy who had walked up the slope.
The pale morning sun filtered through the tall pines as I laced up my hiking boots and prepared for a day on the trails. I had backpacked deep into the Cascades to get away from the noise and stress of everyday life. Out here, I could be fully immersed in nature. Slipping on my pack, I consulted my map and set off down the trail. I hiked for several miles, the only sounds being the wind, rustling leaves, and my boots crunching on the forest floor. At a clearing, I stopped to sip some water and take in the view. Snow-capped peaks jutted up in the distance. All was tranquil. After stowing my water bottle, I stood and stretched my legs. Just then, a loud crack reverberated through the trees ahead. I froze. Another crack boomed, accompanied by heavy bipedal footsteps. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. Gripping my walking stick, I called out nervously, Hello? The footsteps grew louder, branches snapping like gunshots. This was no bear or deer. It sounded like a person. But how? I was miles from civilization. Fear and fascination dueled within me. I wanted to flee, but my legs were paralyzed. The footsteps thudded closer, and suddenly, a massive creature stepped out from the pines. My heart nearly stopped. Standing before me was a huge, hair-covered beast, walking upright on two legs. It stood at least eight feet tall, with broad shoulders and muscular limbs. The face was obscured by a mane of reddish-brown hair, except for two dark, intelligent eyes gazing back at me. We stared at each other, neither of us moving a muscle. My mind reeled, unable to accept what I was seeing. Bigfoot. It couldn't be real, and yet here it was. The biggest discovery in natural history, living and breathing. Slowly, Bigfoot leaned forward, eyes piercing into me with uncanny awareness. It was analyzing me as I tried fruitlessly to analyze it. I was in awe, overwhelmed by this mythical beast made real. Then, calmly, it turned and sauntered back into the ancient forest. I watched, dumbstruck, until it disappeared like a ghost. I hurried down the trail, hands shaking. I knew my claims would be ridiculed and dismissed, but I didn't need validation. My reality had been irrevocably shifted. I had witnessed something beyond explanation, a glimpse into the unknown. Somewhere out there, Bigfoot still dwells, a humbling reminder that nature still holds secrets beyond our grasp. I will forever cherish the brief wonder of our encounter. If you're from Northeast Ohio, you've definitely heard about Squire's Castle in Willoughby. And like many other places in Willoughby, Squires is said to be haunted. My whole life, I've said this is bogus. In fact, the ghost stories that I heard of it felt practically impossible. It's said that at night, through the windows, you can see the lantern light of the owner's wife who died there. This can't be true, because she didn't die there. But I don't know, whatever, I guess. Still, everything I believed about this place changed when some friends and I went ghost hunting the other night. We went in so excited. We had planned to walk up to the castle, look through, and maybe even explore the hiking trails afterwards, all late at night. It was drizzling, not very much, no big storms or anything at the time that we were out there. At right about midnight, driving towards Squires, maybe about a mile away, the three of us in the car saw a bright light in the sky, somewhat above where the castle was. One of us initially thought it was lightning, but it definitely wasn't. It was bright, 
produced no sound and lasted just a couple of seconds. It happened twice, lighting up a circle of clouds in a white, bluish-purple light. We didn't think too much of it at the time, but now it feels like it should be included in the story. Then at about 12.05, we pulled up to Squire's Castle. From the road, before even pulling into a parking spot, we could see it, the lantern. There was an orange glow coming from inside the castle and it was moving. Initially, I thought it was a house behind the castle. Then I remembered nothing was behind the castle except dense trees. It couldn't have been my headlights because they weren't even pointing that way and we weren't moving. One of my friends thought it was just some teens exploring the castle like we had planned to do. But as we pulled into the parking spaces, we saw that there were no other cars and that the light had disappeared. After gathering enough courage, we left the car and started toward the castle. I was recording on a handheld camera. One friend was recording video on his phone and my other friend was recording audio on her phone. We walked all the way up until we could see the castle. I personally didn't see much, but my friends saw quite a bit. Watching his phone, my friend said things like, I saw something flash by on my camera, or there's something moving around inside. My other friend felt a little gross. If you've had the same kind of encounter, I'm sure you'll know what she means. She also said that she saw things moving inside that she was looking with just her eyes and no camera. My friend said she really wanted to go into the building, but my other friend and I wanted to get out of there, me especially. So we turned back toward the car and walked back. On the way back, we were still kind of exploring, thinking that maybe we could see things on the side of the path, but we weren't sure. Then my friend half jokingly said, I low-key want to go back up and into the castle. Shortly after she said this, boom, a heavy stomp could be heard right next to my friend. Nope, she said and ran. The two of us ran after her. My friend said that they heard the stomp and could feel the presence of something right next to them. We got in the car and drove off so fast. All of us were in shock. I was holding back tears. I didn't know what to feel. I had never experienced anything like that before. On our 20 minute drive home, we decided to examine our evidence. First up was the audio recording. We listened back to it and my friend stopped it shortly after it started. She was like, what? Why is it like that? That's so weird. The audio recording started as normal. We leave the car and then we're heading back to the car. The part of the recording where we walked up to the castle and all that was completely missing. We've never had any issues with her phone before. In fact, we've used that exact phone to catch the voices of multiple entities in the past. Then we moved on to the phone video. You can see lots of misty drizzle moving past the camera, and sometimes you can see my friend's breath. It was surprisingly cold for being 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit the whole day. But when we're up at the castle, the video gets a little spooky. We paused the video on the flashes that he saw earlier and saw single frames of shapes running past. These things were differently shaped and colored than the misty water droplets. These were the most terrifying things that we got from the trip, in my opinion. We also got one picture that was kind of clear and whatever it was, wasn't really too human shaped. Also, we could very faintly see shapes of people or reflections of eyes inside the windows. Then on the way back from the castle, we didn't see anything in the video. Recently, I examined my video on a computer. Now, typically people save the best for last, but my video was not the best. I saw very little within it as it was very dark, but on our way up, we could see a couple of orbs and on the way back, we could see small points that kind of looked like sets of eyes peering and blinking. Looking back on the experience, we are kind of filled with dread. My friend is very spiritually active and knowledgeable, 
and feels that we could have been in some serious danger. She says she's definitely adding this to her list when she's felt unsafe from the presence of some kind of entity. I guess we might never know what exactly we experienced that night, but we'll never forget it. Experience in a Haunted Cemetery Posted by Lesson0991 to r slash paranormal I have always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest of the United States, and one of the only things to do out here is just drive around the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery that we came across and found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field where the stones are not even visible, aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet. Another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before but no major sites that we could stomp around at and never experienced anything. We later go to college and still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find this one specific cemetery that is known to be haunted, but the location is kept secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out they have to list the cemetery in county directories. Anyway, he tells us he can take us there, and so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still want to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it's extremely disrespectful and stupid, and we were childish. We ask another question and wait. It was dead silent. And then we hear the leaves crunching step by step from the darkness toward us. It sounds like someone is right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen. Next came the most blood curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of a shock and the whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it. We slowly began walking and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car without a word between us. I still think what if it was a big cat or something, but where I live, that's pretty much unheard of. I've never heard a scream like that to this day and it still gives me chills just thinking about it. I've always been captivated by the supernatural, though I had never had any personal encounters. Being from the Midwest, one of our favorite pastimes was exploring the countryside. My friends and I were particularly drawn to cemeteries, discovering all kinds of hidden treasures. One such was a cemetery nestled on a grassy hill, where the tombstones were concealed beneath the carpet of grass. Another was hidden deep within the woods, across an ancient bridge, with no markers in sight. We had perused various local legends about haunted locations, but hadn't stumbled upon any major sites or experienced anything out of the ordinary. As we moved on to college, we maintained our bond, catching up every other weekend or so. One place we'd always yearned to find was a particular cemetery known for its paranormal activity, but its location remained a well-guarded secret. As it turned out, one of our friends had managed to locate this elusive spot, thanks to county directories. Eagerly, we decided to visit. We arrived at sunset, engaging in casual ghost hunting activities like asking questions and recording potential responses. Though we weren't taking it too seriously, there was still an undercurrent of anticipation for a supernatural encounter. 
In a moment of adolescent recklessness, a friend extinguished his cigarette on a tombstone, hoping to provoke a reaction. I know. After asking another question, we found ourselves enveloped by a profound silence, soon broken by the sound of leaves crunching underfoot. It sounded like someone was approaching us from the darkness, though we saw nothing. Suddenly, the silence was shattered by a scream that seemed to curdle the very blood in our veins. The terrifying event left us somewhat stunned, and it feels surreal to recall it even now. After a moment of frozen shock, we hastened our pace toward the car, gradually breaking into a run, the silence remaining unbroken. Even now, I find myself pondering whether it could have been a large cat or some other creature, despite the improbability given the local fauna. But to this day, I have never heard a scream quite like that, and just thinking about it sends chills down my spine. In the summer of 2019, I became fixated on this ruined castle hidden deep within the woodlands, a day's cycle from where I lived. It is by no means easy to access. We often rode our bikes there, and there was a lot of lugging them through the mud, up hills, and down hills that were too narrow for a bike. Every week in June, my buddy and I would ride out to this castle pack lunch, and make a day out of it. I still have fond memories of those cycles. The castle itself harbored an underground chamber that could be accessed by a small tunnel, leading you into this subterranean room that was strewn with rock and plastered with graffiti. I haven't been to the castle in a while now, but if I remember correctly, some of the graffiti read things like no one leaves and Satan is good. Now is probably a good time to mention that the castle has a long past with rituals and so-called devil worshiping. I've had three peculiar happenings at the castle and I suppose I'll tell them from least likely to be paranormal to most likely. It was by no means a summer day. The sun made the occasional appearance but mostly remained hidden by clouds. To me, it seems like the way to get to the castle is always guarded by an unholy amount of mud, even if it hadn't rained for days. So our bikes would always be splattered by the time we got home. Once under the shaded canopy of the trees and with the mud far behind us, we approached the ruins with the same amount of giddiness we always did. Our giddiness was shattered though, when we heard the sounds of children floating down from the ruins. We liked having the castle to ourselves which in hindsight is pretty selfish. But upon arrival, we found that no children, no families, nobody at all was present. This struck us as odd, seeing as the castle sits on a hill. We ruled out that any family would dare venture down the steep slopes, especially if they had children. And we never heard any children's voices again. The second incident was when I was waiting outside the entrance of the tunnel, about to duck down and head inside, when I heard a sharp whistle right beside my ear. It was as if somebody had placed their mouth mere centimeters from my ear and whistled. The third and final incident was when we brought candles to the castle to take some nice photos of the illuminated chamber. The chamber itself is littered with dried leaves and being paranoid that a rogue spark from the match could potentially cause a fire, we lit them outside and carried them in. On the fourth or fifth candle, while I was lighting a match, there was a thunderous hiss from inside, so loud that I often tell people it was as if a giant snake was in there. Fearing that something had caught fire, I rushed in to find everything the way it was. No fire, with the candles flickering silently. Those are the three occurrences that I've had a hard time explaining. I've been to the castle since, but nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm sure I'll be returning to the castle soon now that summer has once again rolled around. So, who knows? Maybe I'll have more stories then.
Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders, including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins. People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the King never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and to make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Ballycastle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea which has been turned into a hotel. Ballygally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel.
Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour, which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement, which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15, and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh. I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in, back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power, therefore there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately, so naturally, I turned on the EMF. 
It was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable, strong force pushed me into T. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend, as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday. But those stories are for another time. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I have never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the ten of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mom explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost ten years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and... I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick-or-treat thing around the surrounding village. 
I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night, up to the old, bendy, spooky road you take up to the house, and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. The scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around. But it still freaks me out to this very day. I had an experience with the infamous Franklin Castle in Cleveland, Ohio, back in July of 2009. For those not already familiar with the castle, I strongly recommend looking it up. There are a ton of websites that have articles about the history of it, including the known facts, legends, and personal encounters. In July of 2009, my then boyfriend's brother got a free reservation for a guided group tour of Franklin Castle and invited my then boyfriend and myself to tag along with him and his then girlfriend. I've always been fascinated by the castle, so I was pretty excited. I'm not 100% sure that the tour was legal or that the guide even had permission to enter the castle, but regardless, we went. All of the info the guide gave me matched up with everything I had read about it, so at least he was well informed. The guide started outside at 11 p.m. We were in the yard of Franklin Castle, just staring up at it, and all I could keep thinking about was how long I'd wanted to go in there, and I was finally about to. Once everyone that had reserved a spot for the tour arrived, we started. There were about 20 to 25 of us. The guide took us around the outside of the castle, telling us about it, and then we headed in and went to the first floor, which was the basement, where the servants' area initially was. Within about 15 minutes of being in there, I started to feel kind of funny, like overloaded. I knew what was coming and tried fighting it off, but I couldn't. I started to get dizzy and things started to get dark. I went and sat on the steps, 
freezing, pale, and sweating it out. After about five minutes, I was okay to go on. It was just so intense. Things like this have happened to me before when I'm around immense amounts of energy like that. I think the energy of the house was just too much for my sensitivity. We carried on to the second floor, then the third floor. At this point, I was standing around with a couple of other people, listening to the guide tell us about the floor and any story surrounding it. All of a sudden, I hear these light footsteps coming from above. I thought it was just my imagination, or maybe somebody went up there ahead of the guide. Then the girl next to me asks the guy next to her, did you hear that? One of them asked the guide if anyone had gone upstairs yet, and the guide confirmed that nobody had ventured to the fourth floor yet. Then we went to the fourth floor and wrapped up the tour. Part of me couldn't wait to get out of there, but another part of me wanted to look around some more. So I followed my boyfriend's brother and his girlfriend down to the third floor, then the second floor, and finally the first floor. I was walking behind my boyfriend's brother's girlfriend through the kitchen area, and she stopped in the doorway in the living area. I was standing behind her, and I suddenly got this overwhelming feeling of uneasiness, to say the least. I got out of there right away. I made my way outside and waited for the others. The tour was nice, and the castle was amazing. It was all torn up, though. Between the constant attempts at remodeling, the fire, and its age in general, it was in need of a lot of work and completely unlivable at the time. The guide stated that there were all these plans for it, but most never happened. It's been sold again since then. From what I've read online, the current owners have their own plans, but do not have any interest in doing tours. Only time will tell what's in store next for the castle. In the seaside town where I went to university, there stood some awesome castle ruins parallel to the promenade. Two years ago now, and in my final year, I used to go to the ruins at night to chill with my friends. Sometimes we would play a hide-and-seek style game called Murder in the Dark, where we would try and scare each other when we found the opposing team. One night, we were there playing the game two-on-two, -two, and I was searching on my own on one side of the ruins. Bear in mind, it was the early hours and I had a phone with little battery, so I couldn't use my torchlight all the time. The crevices of the ruin and the pitch black sent my tired imagination into overdrive. I became emotional and started crying at the war memorial that was next to the ruins whilst trying to find my friends. I didn't feel upset or scared, it just overwhelmed me, so I put it down to being in the dark. Maybe it made me more vulnerable. When walking back to my flat, I could honestly feel like somebody was following me and getting closer. I kept looking over my shoulder to be sure there wasn't an actual person walking from the footsteps I could hear, only to see an empty street every time. It took a couple of days for anything terrifying to happen, and when it did, when it started, I felt a heavy sense of dread fill my bedroom and follow me around the flat. The strange thing to me was that it never followed me outside when I was out of view of the building I lived in, like whatever it was couldn't travel far from where it had decided to settle. Moving forward a couple more days, and I experienced, during the day, an inability to leave my bed. I wasn't being held down at this point. It was more because I could feel a heavy mass loitering in my bedroom doorway that was constantly watching me. I was too scared to go to the bathroom or kitchen when my flatmates weren't home, and I missed classes. I didn't know what was wrong with me. A week had gone by and I had started sleeping with my lights on, not to mention the very vivid nightmares that made me too freaked out to close my eyes by choice. 
Even so, I fought to sleep, but the entity had drained me and started shadowing me when laying in bed. It could have been sleep paralysis for all my flatmate knew when I told her, yet it felt so real. I went so far as to make crosses by tying two paintbrushes together with an elastic band and sticking it above my bed. They didn't work. I was being pinned to the bed by unseen hands while awake and a weight was on my chest randomly during the day and night, only ever in my bedroom. I also saw a dark figure waiting for me by my bedroom window when I had mustered the strength to go out and buy food. It was watching me walk down the street toward the building and I could feel its eyes on the back of me when walking into town. This happened all day, every day, until I felt too scared to go back to my flat for two consecutive nights of the second week that this was happening. I stayed on my best friend's sofa, and with her being into tarot and spiritual healing, she lent me two of her crystals to take back with me to see if they would help keep the entity at bay. I always believed in spirits and open to my friend's interests, I gratefully took the crystals with me. She had also told me to keep hold of the crystals for as long as I needed them and to be forceful with the entity, to tell it to leave me alone, even if I had to scream at it to show my inner strength. That I was more powerful than it thought I was. The final night of my two weeks in hell, I did everything she had said. And when I got inside, I laid the crystals on the end of my bed and got into my pajamas. When I turned around, the crystals had disappeared. Worried that my friend would go mad if I told her I'd lost them, I said nothing about them for almost a month. It took around two days from when I had the crystals for the dark atmosphere to completely clear. My room felt a safe haven again, and I was able to sleep peacefully without fear. Forgetting all about the crystals, I had moved my bed to clean behind it. When I lifted the mattress, the crystals were on the floor underneath the head of my bed. I took them back to my friend, confessed what had happened, and she suggested the entity must have tried to steal the crystals so that I couldn't use them against it. If it were a true explanation as to why the crystals disappeared when they did, the entity must have been abolished or sent back to where it had come from the moment it came into contact with them. For the rest of the academic year, I kept the cross above my bed for peace of mind, and thankfully, the entity never returned to darken my doorway again. Amidst the crumbling remnants of ancient Greece, where history's echoes whispered through time, a haunting presence lingered, a gorgon named Medusa. Her dread-inducing visage, adorned with writhing snakes for hair, awaited those who dared to venture near, for her petrifying gaze could turn the bravest of souls into lifeless stone. My encounter with this terrifying legend left me with a chilling sense of the macabre. It was within the shadowed corridors of a Greek ruin where the stones bore witness to the passage of centuries that I came upon Medusa's lair. The legends of the Gorgon had always filled me with a sense of foreboding, and now, as I ventured deeper into the labyrinthine passageways, I could feel the weight of her dark tail pressing down upon me. The ancient stones seemed to groan beneath the weight of history as I pressed on, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. The air was thick with the scent of age and decay, and the very atmosphere seemed to tremble with an unnatural tension. And then I saw her, a monstrous figure, her face obscured by a veil of shadow, her hair writhing like serpents in the dim light. It was Medusa, the Gorgon of Greek mythology, a creature whose gaze could bring death by transformation. As I stood frozen in terror, I watched as she moved with a sinister grace, her serpentine hair hissing with a deadly intent. Her eyes, hidden behind a shroud of darkness, exuded a malevolence that chilled me to the bone. 
The legend spoke of Medusa's power to turn those who met her gaze into solid stone, their bodies forever frozen in a grotesque mockery of life. Her curse was said to be an abomination, a punishment for her beauty and the arrogance of men who sought to possess her. I dared not meet her eyes, for the consequences of such an encounter were too ghastly to contemplate. I could feel her presence, her malevolent aura, as she moved closer, her serpentine hair writhing with anticipation. With a shudder, I turned and fled from the ruins, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew that I had come face to face with a force that transcended human understanding, a creature of myth and legend whose power was both horrifying and undeniable. Autumn in Sleepy Hollow carries a distinct chill, a foreboding promise of what's to come. The leaves rustle underfoot, and the air grows crisp as the sun dips below the horizon. It was on such an evening that I found myself walking along the winding roads of this eerie town, shrouded in legends and whispered tales. The moon hung low, casting long shadows as I followed the path that led me to the bridge crossing the Pocantico River. It was there that I first heard the ominous sound of hooves approaching, distant but unmistakable. The night seemed to hold its breath as the echoes drew nearer, and I found myself transfixed. The creature of folklore, the headless horseman, was said to roam these very roads. I'd heard the stories, of course, but like any sensible person, I had dismissed them as mere tales spun to entertain and frighten. But as the thunderous hoofbeats grew louder, doubt gnawed at me. Suddenly, he emerged from the shadows, a monstrous silhouette atop a black steed. I could feel the ground tremble with each pounding step as the horseman drew closer. His form was indistinct, obscured by the inky blackness of the night. What struck terror into my very soul was the absence where a head should be. A fiery pumpkin perched upon his shoulders, its ghastly grin casting an eerie glow upon the surroundings. The sight of it, hovering in midair, seemed unnatural, like some unholy magic brought to life. In that brief moment, I understood the stories were no mere flights of fancy. I dared not move for fear of drawing the horseman's attention. The legend spoke of his penchant for seeking vengeance, and I had no intention of being the object of his ire. Instead, I stood there, rooted to the spot, my heart pounding in my chest as he thundered past me, the malevolent specter of Sleepy Hollow. The wind whistled through the trees as he galloped into the night, his fiery pumpkin casting an eerie glow that slowly faded into the distance. I watched until the last vestiges of the headless horseman disappeared, leaving behind an unsettling silence. I cannot explain what I witnessed that night, nor do I wish to. But this much I know, the legends of Sleepy Hollow are not to be taken lightly. The Headless Horseman is no mere tale to be dismissed. He is a presence that lingers in the shadows, a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. And as I stood there in the moonlit darkness, I couldn't help but wonder if there were other creatures, equally as sinister, lurking in the obscure corners of this world. In Sleepy Hollow, the line between folklore and reality had blurred, leaving me with a chilling uncertainty that would haunt me for the rest of my days. This experience happened to me a couple of years ago and I never found an explanation for it. However, my dad recently found someone on Reddit with a very similar story to mine that happened around the same time and in the same area. I reached out to that person, and they said that I was the fifth person to reach out, saying that they had experienced something similar. 
So I figured I would share my story and see if this has happened to anyone else. Some friends and I had gone camping up in a canyon in Utah. This was in 2020. Some creepy stuff had happened earlier in the night before I made it to the campground. So we were trying to relax, wind down and have some fun like we had planned. We were in high school at this point, so we were doing stupid games like truth or dare and whatnot. It was four friends, our friend's dog and me. There was only one other group somewhat close to us, a couple and their dog who set up their tent a few yards away. They weren't close enough to interact with us at all though. My friends and I were staying up and talking, laughing, etc. When at some point it sounded like somebody's car alarm went off, maybe five to 10 miles up the canyon. The next campsite was pretty far away from ours. We didn't question the sound and went on talking until we noticed that the sound had gotten noticeably closer. It happened so gradually that we didn't notice it at first until it sounded like it was just a few yards away. The noisier we were, the closer it would get to us. As we whispered amongst ourselves about what could be making the sound, it came closer and closer. Finally, the noise was literally just outside our tent, mere inches away from us. None of us dared speak or move an inch in fear of compromising our safety. When we became quiet, so did the noise. After we were dead silent for a few minutes, the noise started up again and began to once again go farther away until it sounded like it was about 10 miles away again. This all happened in the span of 10 to 20 seconds. As the night went on, we heard the noise travel from campsite to campsite in almost no time at all. It didn't go away completely until about three o'clock in the morning. We tried to stay pretty quiet for the rest of the night. All in all, whatever had made this sound traveled the span of roughly five to 10 miles in the span of five to 10 minutes. After that one time when we quieted down, it started up again and then it went back to where it started. That was about 20 seconds of it. Either way, this thing was going like a mile per minute. It wasn't a vehicle because there was no engine sound along with it, no headlights. It wasn't human because there wasn't a single footstep or twig crunch, not even when it was right outside our tent. It made zero noise aside from the beeping. It didn't sound like any animal that any of us knew about, and it traveled way too fast and was much too loud to be any animal, at least any we have around here. We originally thought that the sound was either a vehicle or a machine of some kind because of the consistent pattern of the beeping. However, when we stopped to listen to it for a while, there was a brief moment when the pattern got slightly off tempo, but it sounded accidental and then it quickly returned to the beat. This led us to believe that something was imitating the sound of a machine or a vehicle. We considered everything from weird nocturnal birds to pranksters with an air horn, but nothing added up. We ended up waking up the next morning at 5 a.m. to pack up and leave. The other campers who were sleeping a few yards away from us were already completely gone by the time we got up. This leads us to believe that whatever was messing with us that night had messed with them too. I wish we could have seen our friend's dog's reaction to what happened, but he had already fallen asleep by 8 or 9 p.m., long before the beeping started. It started at about 11 o'clock or midnight, and that dog can sleep through anything. I recently got together with those same friends and brought up what happened that night. One of my friends said that when the rest of us fell asleep, the same thing happened again. But instead of a car alarm, this time the sound was a crying baby, traveling at the same speed and distance as before. And according to her, it circled our tent a few times before fading off again. The people who were camping closest to us did not have a baby. Oh, and one other detail. 
we were less than 50 miles away from Skinwalker Ranch. The summer after my second year in high school, I went up to Pike National Forest in Colorado for a summer field biology camp. It was pretty cool because I'd never been camping prior. I had a small two-man tent that I shared with my buddy from school. We had met this kid at camp and instantly became really good friends. His parents were loaded and his tent, which was about 10 feet from us, was huge, like a 10-person tent. The night before this incident, a huge windstorm blew through the valley and absolutely annihilated his huge tent. Mine was fine because it was low to the ground. Anyway, for the rest of the time, he slept in our already packed tent. I slept closest to the door of the tent because I always had to pee in the middle of the night and I didn't want to have to climb over people. So the night this all went down, I woke up, no idea what time it was, went outside to the forest, peed and crawled back into the tent. I was laying there for a bit and there happened to be a lightning storm overhead, cloud to cloud. As I was watching the light illuminate my tent, I started hearing whispering. It was female whispering, back and forth. I tried to hear what it was saying, but it was unintelligible. The whispering started to get closer and closer until it was right next to the tent by my right ear. It just stopped. I didn't hear anyone walking or anything like that. Then all of a sudden, lightning lit up the tent and there were shadows of people cast onto the side of the tent. That's when the chanting began. It sounded like a different language, all female voices and a bunch of them. I just closed my eyes and slipped under my sleeping bag, terrified, and put my hands over my ears. The next day after breakfast, we all went back to the tent to get changed, and the new guy who was now staying with us says, pretty wild last night, right? To which I responded, you mean the lightning? He said, no, the frickin' scary chanting. I think this place is cursed or something. So it wasn't just me. But it did help that someone else had heard it and we could talk about it. Now, every time I go camping, I stop drinking anything two hours before I plan to sleep so that I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to pee because I am not going out there. From 2013 to 2019, I worked in outdoor education at many different summer camps and outdoor education centers in Canada. Mostly Ontario, but I did spend a season in the Rocky Mountains. Having grown up going to sleepaway camp and eventually participating in month-long leadership programs with backcountry canoeing components, I was well prepared to lead a group of teen girls from a camp in Georgian Bay on a two-week camping trip in the Temagami region during my first year as a counselor. The Temagami region is located between North Bay, Sudbury, and Timmins, Ontario. This region is home to many provincial parks, wonderful hiking and canoeing routes, and the Bear Island Indian Reserve. Our route was fairly typical and beginning in the Whitefish Falls region, ending at Highway 11 after 14 days of paddling portaging, hiking, and campfire making. We had a satellite phone to check in with our camp director every day, and in case of emergency. We also had multiple exit points along the route. Until our second to last night, we were having fun and a relatively uneventful time, other than some mild dehydration and the usual bumps and bruises. Near the end of our trip, we were doing some free camping on the shore of an uninhabited island in Bear Lake which is recognized as part of the Bear Island Indian Reserve. It's a beautiful area, and we were across from the main island that the majority of the 250-person population inhabits. We had put out the fire and gone to bed. 
when about an hour after falling asleep, I was jarred awake by the sound of a loud motorboat. Obviously, this isn't that weird because it's a large lake and many people use boats to reach the mainland or their homes on secluded islands. However, it was around 11 p.m. and things had been quiet for the last few hours. The motor cut out and I could clearly hear the sounds of an argument. It sounded like at least one man and a woman and they were very angry and yelling at each other, although I couldn't hear anything specific because they were too far offshore. Suddenly, the woman screamed and I heard a splash in the water and then total silence. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and hoping to God that my girls hadn't woken up. But I wasn't that lucky because I could immediately hear talking from their tent and I could tell that they were scared. I was about to unzip my door and look out to see if maybe the boaters had had an accident or something when the whole tent lit up. The light slowly panned across me and onto the tent my girls were in, which immediately made them quiet. In a normal volume, I was able to tell them to stay absolutely still. The light panned back onto my tent and then over to theirs again. I can only guess that it must have been some sort of boat with a searchlight on it. After an eternity that was really only about five minutes, the light was turned off and I heard the motor engage and fade as the boat went away from us. I immediately found the satellite phone and called our camp director, who gave us the phone number for the local police. I called them and they said that they would forward the information that I had given to the local native detachment on Bear Island. I don't think any of us slept that night, and I got up at 5 a.m. to take my canoe out and take a look around. I thought maybe somebody had fallen overboard and had managed to swim ashore. Obviously, I didn't find anyone, and there was nothing floating in the water either, although it is a pretty deep body of water. None of us wanted to camp one more night, so I called the camp and had them head out to the pickup point a day early. We paddled like hell and didn't really talk much. I think that none of us wanted to speculate about what we might have heard and what might have happened if we had made a noise or moved when that light was on our tents. I've thought about this a lot over the years, but whenever I've told people the story, they've been quite skeptical. I recently started looking into missing person cases in the area, but without much luck. Regardless of what we heard, something bad happened that night, and I'm just glad that nothing bad happened to us. We were going camping in western Washington. It was late, and we weren't going to make it to our usual campsite. So my uncle mentioned that he knew about a lake not far off the freeway. My uncle had a box truck, and we were all going to sleep in it. There were six kids and my uncle and father. My dad was driving an old Bronco with some of us with him. When we found the lake and parked, us kids went to bed in the box truck, because it was close to midnight. My dad and uncle started a campfire and were just BSing. I couldn't sleep, so I was chilling in my sleeping bag listening to them. All of a sudden, we started hearing wild noises like chanting, and then these sounds that just made the hair on my neck stand straight up. I immediately thought Bigfoot. My dad and uncle freaked out, and my dad got his pistol out. They waited another 10 minutes, and the sounds got louder. Then they got everybody up and packed us all up, and we left in a hurry. I have never seen them that scared. We were all scared. I have no idea what the location was now. I was nine years old, and this was back in the 80s, but that experience never left me. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. 
There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions, all different, old men, old women, younger adults, even children, and I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, so I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings, no laughing, and the forest sounds had returned, relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off. I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. 
In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night, and I've never done it since. A few months ago, three other friends and I went out to camp near a lake. We went camping on the shore of the lake, right next to a forest that went up a hill. It was nighttime, and the sky was very clear. We had a fire going, and so one friend and I decided to go a bit farther near to the lake to look at the stars. You could see the Milky Way and everything. It was really cool. While we were there, we were talking a little bit, and I noticed a light in the forest above where the other two friends were, and above where we were camping. It was really bright in the middle, like a white orb, and at first I thought it was a person with a flashlight. The next thing I know, it zipped in a straight line, super fast, then went back again, with the same speed. Then, instantly, it just disappeared. My other friend who was with me saw it, and we both got really freaked out. He is very religious and can't explain it to me, but still doesn't want to believe that it's anything paranormal. So I'm kind of alone in this. The other friends didn't see anything because it was behind them. I have no idea what it could have been. The weird thing was that it was at the moment we noticed it that it reacted and moved around and disappeared. I wonder if it had been there the whole time while we were camping there would have been no way to see it. Only when we moved away and then faced toward our camp could we have seen it. I told my other friends about it and they thought I was just joking, and the friend who was with me and saw it doesn't want to talk about it, so I don't really have any good answers. For the rest of the camping trip, I felt really uneasy. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god-awful, low, guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child, with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore.
When my nephew was a toddler, about two years old, he would cry at night and say that there was a man in a hat in the closet who would talk to him. He was petrified and he wouldn't even sleep in his bedroom anymore. He would only sleep in his sister's room every night. My brother lives in a home that was built by our grandfather. Our grandfather had cancer when we were teens. By the time it was found, it was really too late. Near the end of his life, we brought him back home and we turned the office room into a hospital room. That same room, many years later, had become my nephew's bedroom. My brother, sister-in-law, and I were all living at the house at the time and we were all a bit startled. We didn't think it could actually be our grandfather though. I mean, he wasn't the type of man to pop out of a closet in the dark and scare the shit out of a toddler. Whatever it was that my nephew saw or thought he saw has left him afraid of the dark and still prefers to sleep in the same room as his sister to this day. Let me start by saying that growing up, my little sister never slept in our room as a child, like ever. Normally she would sleep with my mom due to her freaking out about one thing or another. To be honest, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable about sleeping in there by myself, which I did every night. Her constant freakouts about it, coupled with the feeling of being watched while I was in there alone, even in the middle of the day, made me feel super uneasy. That being said, there was one night that I came home from hanging out with my boyfriend at the time and I walked into my room and who do I see? My little sister. At the time she was five and I was 15 and she was totally fine and in the top bunk. I was incredibly surprised that my mom got her to sleep in her own bed. She looks down from her bunk and points to my great-grandmother's rocking chair. It was then that I noticed that it was slightly rocking back and forth. She laughed as she pointed and said, look, it's grandma. I immediately yelled for my mom to take her and the rocking chair out of my room. My great-grandma had died a few months before and my sister barely knew her. Without pictures, she wouldn't even know what she looked like. It was so creepy. I, ha I have a five-year-old boy. My son once asked me if I knew the man that died here. We were at home. I said, uh, no. He said, I do, and went on playing. A few weeks to a month later, he came up and hugged me and said, I waited a long time for you to be my mom. One time he told me that he couldn't sleep because of all the people calling his name. I don't remember the exact conversation, but it was in a questioning context, like he thought that maybe that happened to me too. I asked him if it was scary and he said no. Scared me though. I called my sister and asked her to sage my house. My nephew, who was two and a half at the time, sister and her husband used to live in my house. One day, my nephew was looking out the window and sharing his juice with the window. His mom asked him what he was doing and he said something about sharing his juice with the man. My sister assumed he was sharing with his reflection and didn't know the word for boy, so she brushed it off. He then began to show off his dino slippers. No big deal. Next day, he's back at it, except this time he says the man had his horses and was scary. 
She looked out the window. Nothing, and no horse-related items in the room at the time. As she's looking, my nephew runs over and begins to cry, saying the man was scary. His dad came home later and shot the bad guy away with a Nerf gun, and he never appeared again. This is really weird because both my sister and I, the only two of us who have ever slept in the front end of the house where this happened, used to see this scary looking man out of the other window wearing a cowboy hat. My sister even found a dog tag with info on it about a man. We looked up the information though and found nothing of use. I don't remember anything written on the tag. We live in a fairly big new neighborhood and there were no local deaths. It was really, really odd. I was babysitting my nephew, who was around four to five years old at the time. From down the hall, I heard him use the bathroom, but noticed that he didn't flush. When I inquired about it, he said, the man in my bedroom gets angry when I make noises. This was particularly unsettling, considering my sister and her husband had purchased their home from a man whose father had passed away in that very house. When my daughter was about four, we had just finished her bath. I had her on her bed, drying her off. All of a sudden, she said, Daddy just said, hey. I was taken off guard because my husband worked second shift and was not home at the time. I said, no, baby, Daddy isn't here. She said, no, Daddy just said, hey. Then she looked all weird and got scared. She didn't want to be in her room anymore. I don't know if it was my reaction or response that made her that way or not, but it sure gives me chills and creeps me out. I called my husband just to calm my nerves and make sure he was okay. Either way, that was still one of the creepiest things a kid has ever said to me. My cousin, who is 14 years younger than me, was playing in his bedroom at about age two, maybe three. Suddenly, he starts screaming and bolts out of the room into my arms. I asked him what had happened, expecting him to say that he got hurt or something. He's sobbing, saying, scary guy, scary guy. It was the middle of the day, bright and sunny, and his room was on the second floor. So I just thought something startled him and I was going to go show him that everything was okay. I tried coaxing him back to the bedroom, but he wasn't having it. I went and checked the room for myself and there was nothing spooky, no one there. I finally convinced him to come back into the room, but he insisted on being in my arms when he did. When we got to the room, I said, see, nothing to worry about. But he pointed to his closet and said, scary guy over there. So I walked over to the closet and looked, nothing. So I told him there's nothing here. He turns around and looks at the ceiling of the closet. And that's when he starts shrieking and climbing up my body, trying to get out of my arms and away from the closet. I bolted out of that room with him and he calmed down. I never did figure out what he saw but that room always freaked me out from then on until the day that they finally moved. My 
My three-year-old, who is normally very happy-go-lucky, was extremely concerned the other day. He kept looking around the room, talking about the rhino. Who knows what a three-year-old might translate as a rhino? This went on for about 20 minutes, and he was very concerned and looking around the entire time. So we get to a point where he says, the rhino is moving. My wife asks where the rhino is, and he just says, he's coming to daddy. He, yeah, um, I'm daddy, and my ass puckered just a wee bit after that comment. Fast forward about four days, and he starts talking about the ghost. My daughter asks my son, where's the ghost? And my son says, he's biting daddy. What the actual hell is happening? This happened a few weeks ago. My wife was working late and I had just put our two-year-old down for bed. I left the hallway light on, told him that I loved him and left his door open just slightly. I headed into my office to finish up some work and occasionally I would glance at the baby monitor. I could tell he was just about to doze off so I paid slightly less attention. Five minutes later, I look over and he's just staring at his door on his side and I can hear him talking. I'm hoping that he'll eventually go down, but he doesn't. So eventually I head to his room. I said, hey buddy, you okay? He says, daddy at door. I said, nope, daddy was in his office. He says, someone at door. I understand toddlers have immaculate imaginations, but crap. That is not what I wanted to hear. When I was younger, my brother and I were babysitting my goddaughter. We were all downstairs watching movies while lazing around on the couches when she starts to laugh hysterically and starts talking to what seemed like the stairs, repeating stuff like, that's funny. When I asked her what she was laughing at, she replied with, over there, can't you see him? The man with the green teeth sitting on the stairs. My brother and I grabbed her and got right out of there. I still don't like that basement. So I work with kids and one of them comes up to me and he asks me if I have ears. I'm thinking that's kind of an odd question, but I say, yes, I do have ears. He goes, if you have ears, then why can't you hear the people asking me to play with them? I stare at this kid in shock as he walks away. I was like, what do you mean? But he never answered me. That really freaked me out because all the other teachers that I worked with there were convinced that the building was haunted. Up until that point, I didn't believe them. But after that, I don't know. I was babysitting my brother's girlfriend's kid, who is three, almost four. We were eating in the kitchen and all of a sudden he started to have a full on conversation with no one. I jokingly said, wow, you have a lot to say. Who are you talking to? He then just stared into the living room, which happened to be completely dark at the time. He stared for a few minutes, which made me feel pretty uneasy. It was probably a kid's active imagination, 
but my brother works at an old cemetery, and we always joke about what would happen if a ghost ever followed him home. Maybe that wasn't such a joke after all. A few years back, I was babysitting a little girl who was around four. I'll call her Emma. So Emma was a bubbly child, very energetic and always laughing. She also happened to have an imaginary friend named George with whom she played constantly, but she never really mentioned him other than to tell me and her parents who she was playing with. One day, as she was playing with this George, she suddenly turned to me and said, George doesn't like you. I was startled and asked her why he didn't like me, but Emma only repeated what she'd said before. I asked what George looked like, and she said that he was very tall with a red face and an eye patch. I, of course, got creeped out. Fortunately, she never said anything like that again, but I would sometimes catch her whispering to herself as she stared at me, only to resume playing when she saw that I caught her. One day, I was walking by my nephew's bedroom. I thought I heard a noise, so I got a little bit closer, just to listen in and make sure everything was okay. I heard him whispering, so I stopped and opened the door a bit. I said, who are you whispering to? He said, no one. Just as I started to walk away, I heard him whisper again, but this time I heard what he was saying loud and clear. He said, shh, she's gonna hear you totally creeped me out. When my little niece was like four, we were in the car and randomly she goes, Mommy, are we puppets? My sister was like, no, no, baby, we're not puppets. My niece thought about it for a moment and then said, I think we are. We just don't know it yet. Incredibly ominous, little child. Thanks. One night, I was laying in bed watching TV, and I saw a ghost in my bedroom door against the blackness of the hallway. He was obviously a ghost because of how his face looked. It was really messed up. He was wearing a cowboy hat. I stared at him for a good few minutes without moving, but not really feeling scared either. Then he sort of just melted into the darkness behind him I convinced myself I was dreaming. In the morning, my then three-year-old daughter came up to me and, totally unprompted, said, Mummy, did you see that man last night? The one and only time I've ever truly seen a ghost and my kid creeps me out because I couldn't convince myself it was just a dream anymore. She saw him too. As a warning, this story does contain the mention of self-deletion. When I was around six years old, my dad's best friend ended his life. We'll call him Joe for the sake of the story. Obviously, it was a very rough and emotional time for my dad. Joe was my dad's best man at his wedding, the one guy who was always there for him. 
After my dad got married, he and my mother left Joe and the town they were in to start a life outside of the town that they grew up in. After years of moving around California, my family eventually moved to Utah, where my father worked for a successful internet business. Joe stayed behind in Washington. Because my family were so far away from their old life with Joe, there wasn't a lot of foresight or warning that Joe had intended on self-deletion. Joe's sister apparently had been blaming Joe's wife for the whole incident. Joe and his wife drank a lot and probably as a result fought a lot. My father always said that they were a passionate couple. Yes, they would fight often, but he hardly knew two other individuals who were so completely in love. For this reason, he didn't believe it. A few days after Joe self-deleted, his widow called up my father sobbing about how she thought it was her fault. After about an hour of trying to console her, he told her, if there was a way for me to talk to Joe now, I guarantee you that he would tell you that he loved you and that it wasn't your fault what he did. Crying, she still didn't believe him, but she thanked him for the kind words and let my father go. My dad was obviously distraught after that long conversation. He had been down in his office for a while, and he decided to come up and check on his kids while making a pot of coffee to take his mind off things. We were all supposed to be napping, but he thought he would peek his head into our rooms just to make sure we were safe. Maybe to try to have a little smile or brightness added to his day. Sure enough, when my dad got to my room, I was fast asleep on my bed and had been for quite some time. He went to my brother's room and he was also sleeping. Finally, he checks on my sister, who is sleeping as smugly as an angel. He decides to go back toward my room and the kitchen to continue making and pouring his coffee. As he walks by my room, he notices a whimper. He turns around and enters my room where he finds me weeping when two seconds ago, I was fast asleep. I was five years old and he said that the way I was crying seemed odd to him for my age. Normally a five-year-old cries kind of drastically and over dramatically. I wasn't. I was just sitting on the side of my bed, weeping. My dad enters my room and says, Maddie, what's up? Why are you crying? It's then that I stop crying for just a moment, look up at him with tears in my eyes and say, Rick, it's not her fault. I love her. It's not her fault. With that, I stopped crying and rolled over back into my bed and fell swiftly back to sleep. I have no memory of this happening and I never heard the conversation. In fact, it wasn't until years later that I was even fully aware of what was going on with my dad's best friend. So it's not like I just heard them talking and repeated it. Needless to say, my dad almost needed new pants after that one. When my daughter was three or four, she came upstairs from playing in the basement when we were visiting family. She asked if it was okay to play with great grandpa, who was asking if he could play dolls with her. She had never heard the term great grandpa before, mainly because her great grandparents were long dead. Turns out my wife's grandpa died in that house. This is a really short story, but it's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to me. My boss's kid came into my office and saw an old picture of my son. She said, oh, you have a little boy? I told her, yes, I do, but he isn't that little anymore. Before I could even finish my sentence, she said, because he's dead. I said, no, he's alive and well. He's just older now. She then looked me dead in my eyes and said, when are you going to die? 
creepiest thing I've ever encountered. Not really creepy, but years ago, I was told I probably wouldn't be able to have kids. About four years ago, my three-year-old nephew came up to me and poked my belly a couple of times. Then he said, there's someone in there, before running away. He was right, and also correctly guessed the genders of both of my kids before I ever knew I was pregnant. Like I said, not really creepy, but still kind of weird. After my brother died, we didn't tell my children because I wasn't ready. One of my sons, three years old, pointed at his picture and said, Oh, Uncle Matt, he's my ghost friend that goes to the woods. A few weeks before this, he made me shut his door every single night because he didn't want his ghost friends to go to the woods to sleep. Super creepy, but also creepily comforting. As a child, like many others, I was accompanied by an array of imaginary friends. Among these figments of my young imagination, the one I remember distinctly was a little girl named Sophie. Sophie, approximately my age at the time, between four and six, was just an ordinary girl wearing a dress and socks. The peculiar thing about her was the noticeable crook in her neck. I grew up in an old house, possibly around 80 years old, with our next door neighbor who we affectionately referred to as Grandma and who has lived there for 60 years. This fact bears significance to the story. Sophie was my closest friend during my early years, a phenomenon not uncommon among children. We spent a lot of time talking and playing in my room, but she never ventured downstairs, claiming fear. It was a usual occurrence for me to descend the staircase, turn back and reassure her, hey, see, it's okay, you can come down. Regardless, she would stay put, a fact I found utterly perplexing. As I aged, my interactions with Sophie dwindled, and ultimately, she faded from my memory. That was until, after relocating, my mother and I paid a visit to Grandma and began reminiscing about my childhood spent in the old house. My mother mentioned my habit of addressing the staircase when I was young, which piqued Grandma's curiosity prompting her to ask, who were you speaking to? I casually answered, oh, Sophie, and I started to describe her. Grandma fell into a silent contemplation. After a while, she said, you know, when I initially moved into this house, my neighbors were preparing to move out. Tragically, a month before their departure, their daughter slipped and fell down the staircase succumbing to her injuries. She had broken her neck. You know, I do believe her name was Sophie. In 2013, Following my amicable divorce from my wife, we both relocated to separate residences. We've remained good friends, largely due to our shared parenthood of our daughter. To ensure fair custody, I rented an appealing house located in the city's historic district. Constructed in 1935, it was well-preserved and offered a perfect home for our three-year-old daughter during her fortnightly stays with me. 
It was during these visits that I began to notice my daughter conversing with an unseen friend. On one occasion, I discovered her in a tiny closet, deep in conversation with a little girl that she referred to as Betty. Considering her age, I assumed this was a product of her vibrant imagination, particularly as I had no idea where she had heard the name Betty. As a single dad to a little girl, I struggled with some aspects of parenting, particularly tasks like hairstyling. While her mother had a knack for it, I was left floundering. One evening, I put her to bed following a bath and remember giving her a quick hairbrush, but that was the extent of my hairstyling capabilities. The following morning when my daughter was just rising, her mom came to pick her up. She discovered our daughter's hair had been transformed into flawless fringe braids. Initially, she praised me for managing such an intricate hairstyle, but I assured her that I had not, and could not, have done it. When we quizzed our daughter about her braids, she said, Betty did them during the night. Aren't they pretty? This incident prompted me to break my lease, and we moved out within the next month. Betty did not come with us. My mom said that when I was about nine or 10 at night while I was sleeping, she would come into my room to turn my Christmas lights off. This was about late November or early December. And I apparently woke up immediately after she turned off the first set of lights and started screaming at her, what are you doing? Stop, really loudly. She turned the lights back on and I apparently went back to sleep. She asked me in the morning while I was getting ready for school if I remembered it happening, and I didn't. I'm 14 now, and still to this day, I don't remember that event happening. I'm sure that this startled the hell out of my mom, but it probably wasn't paranormal. Either way, she got a good scare. I babysit two kids frequently. I had them in the kitchen eating their dinner and I needed to use the restroom. So I went across a small hall to get to the stairs. The girl who was seven at the time thought I was out of earshot. And she says to her brother, wouldn't it be funny if Emmy fell backwards and cracked her skull open at the bottom of the stairs? There would be blood everywhere. It creeped me out more because she thought I couldn't hear her. The boy told me he heard scratches and growling inside of his closet one night, which is why he refuses to sleep alone to this day, and that he had also seen shadow figures, quote, the size of his dad, who's about 6'2". Their home is creepy. I've been with these people for six years, and I also dog sit for them when they go out of town, which is frequent, and take it from me, their home is definitely haunted. When my daughter was three or four, she was downstairs at my in-laws while we were visiting. There was a playroom down there with dolls and things like that. We were upstairs in the kitchen when she came up and asked, is it okay to play with great grandpa? She said it like she was asking if she could play with her dolls. At the time, she never had a great grandparent and had never even heard the term before. The thing is, her great grandfather died in that house about 30 years prior. When I still lived at my mom's place, 
I used to share the same bedroom with my younger sister. As a child, she used to sleepwalk almost every night. Nothing creepy, just usually walking to my mom's bedroom or looking for the bathroom and then coming back to bed with the help of my mom. This stopped when she was around 10 years old and for around the next five years, nothing happened. I've always been super sensitive for sensing energies around me. For a long time, I'd felt a deeply bad energy at my mom's home and felt like someone was with me, looking at me all the time. I just felt purely unsafe. One night, I woke up to my sister sitting on her bed across the room, staring at nothing and talking quietly with her eyes fully open. I remember low-key laughing at first before asking what on earth she was talking about. She didn't say anything to me, but stopped mumbling while sitting up and staring at that same spot of nothing. I remember frowning and asking who she was talking to, and she turns to me and goes, to that man standing right there. The second she said that, I turned to face the space that she'd been staring at, and I didn't see anything, but I felt an overwhelming dark presence of something in the room. I started crying and literally ran into my mom's bedroom to tell her what had happened. Almost the scariest part about this was that my mom has never believed in anything supernatural or evil. She's Christian, but she only believes in God, angels, and the devil himself, and therefore she never believed our stories. But the second I told her this one, I could see the deep worry and fear in her face. It almost seemed like she had seen or experienced something too. My sister didn't remember any of this in the morning. For around a year, nothing happened, but then it all started again. Although that time, it was even scarier. But that's a story for another day. Every once in a while, I'm asked, what's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to you? And this is always my response. My son used to say things like, in former times when I was older, usually followed by something older people would say. He would say things like, in former times when I was older, we would have to wait for the milkman to bring the milk. When he started school, we had to tell him that maybe this wasn't the best thing to say to the other kids. He said it so regularly and casually that we were a little bit worried about how the other kids would react. He stopped saying it all together when he turned 10. I have no idea if he has any memories of these events. So my mom and I were camping in our sort of local national park in the Alps. I had a headache and had had a rough night, but nothing special. My mom, who thought that I had slept really well, really did not. The next morning, she told me about the dreams she had had and that they were really realistic and they kind of scared her. She thought she heard men talking outside of our tent in a foreign language and thought that we were going to be in trouble being that we were two women alone in the middle of nowhere. Then she saw a woman walk slowly just next to our tent while looking in at us, kind of wearing a farm outfit. The next thing she saw was a whole lot of people dressed in white in the trenches just standing there. Back in the day, this national park was the site of a world war event. There are still remnants standing around. That particular night, I didn't see anything particular and I had no idea my mom was having such bad dreams. We thought it was maybe sleep paralysis, but the more we talk about it, it feels more like an encounter than a simple episode of sleep paralysis. Maybe they were just dreams, but she said it was nothing like any dream she'd ever had, that it was so vivid 
that she was sure it was real. We're okay. We're just wondering about the weirdness of it all. And we're curious if anything similar has happened to you. So about three years ago, I went camping with my now ex-girlfriend, as she had always expressed an interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest, and it's my go-to trail and camp spot. It's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs, etc. My family has been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends that introduced me to it have been going for about ten years or so. We went for a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to the campsite, but they were just stargazing and they ended up leaving. Around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like somebody was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended. It got very high-pitched and sounded as it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. And that's when the laugh noise moved up higher and started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped. Then it started up again at about 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in my hand, and I turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see coyotes or something like that around the campsite. I didn't see anything or hear any movements. This went on until about 6 a.m., and then it stopped. That's when we were finally able to get some rest. After we woke up, we checked around the campsite, but we didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I went to start my vehicle, and it was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I am always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery, and I made sure that everything was closed properly and unplugged the night before. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from AAA somehow. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but at the end we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite and also had a cabin in the same forest about 25 miles away. When I told him what happened, he got freaked out. He told me about two incidents, which he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the tree looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight up at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, there they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that leads into the woods. They stated that the height of the eyes that were looking at them meant that whatever it was had to be at least seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes had disappeared. But once they were done shooting, the eyes reappeared, this time closer. At that point, they were both freaked out and went back to the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all feel very scared. We especially felt fear at the time that the events were happening. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thinks it might have been a Wendigo. I don't really know what it could have been but I have never felt that scared before or since. I was nine years old and camping out with three families other than my own. I was sleeping in a small tent with one of my close friends when something woke me up. I listened and heard nothing from outside at first, 
So I opened the tent zipper enough to see the fire was out, so I knew the adults must be asleep. I closed the zipper and I laid back down. Shortly after I laid down, I heard a high-pitched voice from outside the tent. It kept saying, Come out. Come out and play with me. I would have thought that it was a person, but it was repeating itself over and over again and moving closer to the tent and then farther away, all the time circling. I opened the tent and looked out, but it was pitch black. At this point, I tried to wake the friend I was in the tent with, but he pushed me off. I tried again more violently this time, and he woke up. I told him that I heard something outside, but he must not have been fully awake, because he just mumbled something and laid back down. After I talked to my friend, I tried to go to sleep, but the voice kept me up, always beckoning me to come out and play, always circling the tent. I don't know when exactly, or how, but somehow I drifted off to sleep. The next morning I told my friend who had been in the tent about it, and he said that he remembered being annoyed that I woke him up. So to me, that means that I wasn't dreaming. I'm certain that I was fully awake, so I doubt that I just hallucinated it. I know this didn't lead anywhere satisfactory, and I don't have any answers, but this is my true story about something that I can only assume is paranormal. This story happened in my childhood, when I was about 12 years old. I thought about it ever since, and I still don't know what it actually was, or what I should think of it. It's not the most spectacular story, but it was creepy to me. I grew up in an apartment that was pretty much outside the city and close to a forest, so we had a lot of green around where we were, always playing in it and sometimes going camping outside with friends in the summer. So, one night a couple of friends and I decided to build up my tent and sleep outside. We were always staying up for a really long time and telling each other ghost stories. While we did this, we suddenly heard noises from outside the tent. We all held our breath. Then, we could hear steps. They came closer and closer. And then the steps even went around our tent. And then they stopped. We got really scared, and we started saying things like, Whoever you are, go away, or we'll call the police. It seemed to work because the steps continued and headed away from our tent. After a minute or so, we then tried to be brave and went outside the tent to see who had come. But the only thing we could see was a woman in a really long dress, walking away in the dark. I still don't know who or what that was, but she had no business being out there. It still gives me chills to this day. I've always been sensitive, and I've had some paranormal experiences. My son has said some creepy things to me that hint that he might also be sensitive. The other night, he told me that he saw somebody standing by our hall closet door, right outside of the big bedroom door. He's six, but he sleeps with us. He said there was somebody standing by the closet looking into the room last night. I said, what? Are, are you sure it wasn't just the door? Yes, he said. I asked if it was a piece of clothing or a towel or something on the banister. He said, no, it was somebody looking in. I asked if it was a kid or an adult, and he said it was an in-between size. I asked him if he was sure that it wasn't our tuxedo cat. He said, well, I don't think our cat can stand up on his legs like that. That's when I stopped asking questions. Thank you. 
My niece used to sleepwalk, which is kind of creepy in and of itself. One night at like 3 a.m., she went to my brother and sister-in-law's bedroom, stood in the doorway, and just said, she's here. Another thing that happened, my stepdaughter, about the age of eight, was in her room sleeping, and I was in our bedroom scrolling Reddit. My husband is in the living room, watching TV. Sometimes you would hear her mumble in her sleep. No big deal. This night, though, I hear what sounds like a full conversation. She's talking normally, like she would to a friend. I turned my fan off, and I heard her say, Do what? Then a pause. And then, No, I can't do that. Seconds later, I see my husband walk into her room and ask, Hey, what are you doing? You okay? Lay down and go to sleep. He laid with her for a little bit and then came back out to the living room. I went out there and was like, were you guys talking? He said, no. When I went in there, she was sitting straight up in her bed with her eyes open and I told her to lay back down. I told him what I heard her say and he decided that he'd better sleep in her room tonight because that's really creepy. I asked her the next morning if she had had any bad dreams, if she remembered talking to anybody, and told her what she said. She had no idea what I was talking about, and didn't remember a thing. My parents forced me into a church camping trip. I wasn't from any church, and I didn't really want to be friends with the people there. My female cousin went too, so we had nice conversations. The place was okay, but around it was a lake, and a bridge to the forest on the other side of the lake. There was this weird air in the areas around the camping place that we were. I remember exploring it, and there was a very bad energy there. Ripped clothes, campfires that looked old, black trash bags hanged into trees. All that in the forest around the camping area as well. I suppose it was kind of normal, but it just gave off a bad vibe. On one of the last nights there, they finally lighted a campfire for people to come around. My cousin and I were talking for a moment, and then we remained quiet for five minutes or so. I looked far away into the forest to that little lake that was splitting off from there. I suddenly saw a man running around the lake in the forest area. He was wearing big, white, Jesus kind of clothes and no shoes. He ran fast, and while I watched him, I felt this really bad energy. I looked at my cousin, and then she looked at me. We were both pretty spooked. I asked her if she saw something there, and she described exactly what I saw. We got this really creepy feeling from it, but nobody from the church would believe us. Even today, I remember clearly that the man, if that's what he was, looked tall, white robes, very pale, running on completely bare feet, giving off this really bad vibe. He looked human, but it was almost like he wasn't. I know it's not as much of an impressive story as others, but it was one of the realest things I've ever experienced, and I really don't think that guy was a human. The man disappeared within seconds after me spotting him and looking away, and we never saw him again after that. There was nowhere for him to go. I still can't explain it. So, last weekend, I went camping at Brownwood State Park in Texas. I had to shower that night, so I made my way to the camp showers. They were incredibly loud, but it wasn't a big deal. I showered like normal and had the shower off to dry off and leave. I heard a loud knocking on the door suddenly. It was perfectly rhythmic. One knock, two second pause. One knock, two second pause for about 10 knocks. 
I finally shouted, Occupied. It stopped for a beat, and then continued. I shouted, I'll be out soon. Assuming it was my boyfriend, I just let it go. A few knocks later, it finally stopped. Then I heard my boyfriend come to the door, knock softly, and ask, Sweetie, you almost done? I had immediately assumed that it was my boyfriend messing with me, but I noticed later I never heard whatever was knocking come or go, and I could hear my boyfriend walk up to the door from a distance. I had been accusing him of messing with me, but he's very no-nonsense and seemed as scared as I was. He had a flashlight and said that he didn't see anybody leaving. At the time the knocking stopped, there was about a 45 second gap from the knocking stopping and him walking up. It was really weird. I didn't shower at night after that, but I'm really glad I didn't open the door to whatever was knocking. Anyone had something weird happen like this while camping? About 15 years ago, my old high school group decided that we were going to attempt to contact my friend Ben's biological dad. He had recently died before he got to know him. Now, Ben was absolutely wild. He wasn't scared easily. My high school sweetheart was with us and he was absolutely terrified. I owned a necklace that had items placed on it for protection from spirits. To help ease his anxiety, I placed the necklace around his neck. We partook in the devil's lettuce and started our session giggling. I was no believer in Ouija boards. It didn't bother me one bit that we decided to do this in an abandoned church deep in the woods either. Only my boyfriend was terrified, which caused our friends to tease him mercilessly. The board was set up and we got serious. We had no idea, however, just how serious this was about to become. As the planchette moved to spell his father's name, I smiled, thinking that this was his closure. He was clearly doing it because he had refused to share the name beforehand. It had to be him. But looking into his eyes, I saw something I had never seen etched into his face. It was fear. I can't remember how it all went down, but suddenly the board was spinning and it had spelled out murder. I was starting to feel cold, even in the heat. That's when it all went to crap. The pews, already broken, were shaking uncontrollably, even toppling over. We were in a back room that was essentially empty, but we ripped open the door to discover the pews falling over. It started a massive panic to get out of the building. As I was running, I realized my boyfriend wasn't with us in the woods. I turned back right as Ben and a few others pulled off in their cars. Once I re-entered the dilapidated church, my boyfriend was stuck, literally stuck to the floor, screaming. The building was still shaking. It was ice cold, and it felt like a sock had been shoved in my mouth. I remember my best friend helping me carry him out of the building. Within an instant, he had his wits about him and refused to talk about what happened. He looked like he'd just been through war. He opted to keep my protection necklace on, citing that the demon may follow one of us. We never really talked about what happened. That was very strange for my very open friend group. We knew it wasn't an earthquake, because we live just about an hour below the Blue Ridge Mountains of Appalachia, and we never get quakes that could move furniture like that. And to be honest, I felt something dark around me, until a cleansing 11 years later after the scariest haunting I'd ever experienced happened. I don't know what we released or have any clue how it could have been a natural event. Something threw those church pews to pieces, and needless to say, we never went back. About a month after my grandfather died from cancer, I had started a new job and had to go away for training. 
As my grandmother was retired, she cared for my children, aged seven and nine at the time, during the week while I was away. This was during the summer. She told me that one afternoon, my seven-year-old came stomping into the house and said something like, Pop is mad I went into the shed. My grandfather, who we called Pop, had a shed that he never wanted the kids in because he had his tools, gas for mowers, and paint in there. Nothing that kids need to be into. And when he was alive, he wouldn't let them go in there. I asked my son about it when I came home that weekend. He told me he went into the shed and Pop threw a hammer at him. I think a tool fell off a shelf, not that one was actually thrown at him, because if it was my Pop, he would never do that. He also said that Pop would play with them in the yard during the day. Having seen a ghost as a child and not being believed, I believed him. I was also comforted by the story, as his death was still recent and I really missed him. So I was glad that he was still around to play with the kids and watch over them. Half a decade back, I embarked on a journey with my church group to a location just beyond the periphery of Pittsburgh. The trip was thrilling to me, an opportunity to be with my friends, and I was absolutely certain nothing out of the ordinary would happen. Until then, I had been skeptical about the existence of ghosts. The concept fascinated me, but it seemed implausible. A bit about our setting. Our accommodation was an eerie old church building that had an unsettling aura about it. I don't precisely recall its name, but it was in a dilapidated condition with revolting bathrooms. On our inaugural night there, my three friends and I were surprisingly given our own room, an allowance typically not granted to those under 18. Being around 15 or 16 years old with no chaperone, we were understandably eager to break the rules and stay up late. Since it was a warm night, we left the window open, and that's when we noticed something unusual. A figure was standing in the parking lot, staring up at our window, despite it being around 2 a.m. We attempted to engage in a conversation with it, but to no avail. It remained motionless. In an attempt to figure out who or what it was, my friends used their iPhone flashlight, revealing a chilling fact. This entity had no discernible face. It felt like a surreal dream. The moment we shone the light on it, it vanished. The next day, we discussed the incident with others and heard about a legendary ghost named Molly. Dismissing it as a fabricated tale, we decided it was just our imagination playing tricks on us, which was a comforting conclusion. We put the episode behind us for a few days. However, my friends claimed to have heard strange sounds one morning, although they never really elaborated. By the time they heard it, I had already departed. But the tale doesn't end there. We all stayed up late again, secure in our locked room, when abruptly, the door burst open. My friend, whom we'll call T, mockingly referred to Molly using some derogatory terms, firmly believing we were being pranked. Almost instantly, the door slammed shut, resounding throughout the room. Panic ensued as the door began to creak open again, prompting us to dash out of the room. It's worth noting that the hallway lights were on, and we didn't see anyone else around, and we would have. We bolted downstairs, bumping into a woman who had awoken, sensing a disturbance. To our surprise, she revealed that she performed exorcisms. Following her advice, we placed a Bible beneath our door and took other forgotten measures to protect ourselves. That night has been indelibly etched into my memory. Several others claimed to have witnessed strange occurrences, too, which provided us with some reassurance that we weren't losing our minds. Even to this day, 
The nature of what we saw remains a mystery, casting an unsettling chill over me whenever I recall it. My sister and nephew used to live in a small house in the old, original area of town when he was very young. She had this touch lamp that would be off when she walked by, but on when she came by his room later. She would hear my nephew babble in his baby speak and would ask him who he was talking to. One time, he answered that he was talking to the man. In the next week or so, I went over to hang out and he started talking at nothing when he woke up from his nap. She had told me about what had happened, so we decided to see if we could get more out of him. He was able to tell us that it was a sad grandpa, which we think just meant that he was older, wearing a hat, oh, and that he was up in the air. We couldn't tell if he meant floating, and he said, no, he was swinging. He pointed up toward the light fixture. We went back out to the living room as a group, and the lamp was on again. Never happened again after she moved out of that house. My wife and I were camping last night in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon. We camp here often and decided to explore up FSR 520. FSR means Forest Service Road for those who don't know. We found a cool abandoned bridge far back in the woods over Cook Creek. The spot was beautiful and we were set up over the river on this long abandoned bridge over the creek. If you've ever been into the Oregon woods, you know that they can give off a creepy vibe, and this was no exception, but it really was a dream campsite. Being 40 feet directly over a river while on a bridge with limbs growing everywhere all over it isn't your everyday spot. I'll throw in for background that there was nobody within at least three miles of us. We had to hike in a little from our car, approximately a tenth of a mile. We explored around the area for quite a while and didn't come across anything out of the ordinary besides a pair of shoes and a name, Mona, written in ash on a rock of the fire ring. While we were sitting by the fire, I noticed a very bright flash of light over the river and I snapped my head up, but didn't see anything. A few moments later, I was paying closer attention and I watched a ball of light float, even with the bridge 40 feet in the air, from one side to the other in the woods, over 50 feet. The light was very blue. My thought the first time had been that somehow headlights had come through, but I would have heard a car, and no man-made light could get to us in this isolated area. This blue light was unlike anything I've ever seen. I mentioned it to my wife, but I didn't want to freak her out, so I dropped the subject soon after. Later that night, in the tent, we had the mesh lining up where we could see outside. My wife gasped and watched as the same blue light floated at the end of the bridge 30 feet away and hovered in the air. After a good bit of time, it shot into the woods. It being late at night, we were obviously scared of somebody's headlamp, but it shot away 40 times as fast as any human could go, and there was nothing attached to it. Our dog left the tent and stared at the spot for the next ten minutes, while peeking down the side of the bridge very seriously. Has anybody else had a similar experience on Forest Service Road 520 in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon? Or maybe in the Pacific Northwest at all? I'd be very curious to know. From 1993 to 1998, every summer I attended a Christian youth camp for girls. 
Camp lasted four days and three nights. There were about 200 girls at the camp, and it was about a one and a half to two hour drive away from our homes. Some of the camping areas were tent only. Others had A-frames, and at least one of the camping areas had longhouses. The campground is called Ensign Ranch in Kittitas County, Washington. You can look online to see pictures of what these different camping areas look like. It's a really safe campground, and we had a lot of fun every year. In the evenings, we would tell spooky stories, pretty typical stuff for youth camps. On the last night of camp in 1996, I was 15 at the time, there were several of us girls on the top level of our longhouse. It was past bedtime, so we were quietly telling scary stories. I had told a couple, one with the help of a friend I'll call Lily. I don't remember the specific stories from that night. Just typical, and the hook was hanging from the car door kind of stuff. After a couple of hours of spooky stories, someone else was talking and I was getting really tired and could hardly keep my eyes open. Then some of the girls asked me to tell one more story. So, I start telling a story, making it up as I go. Just typical, on a dark night, in the woods not far from here, type of beginning. Next thing I know, I wake up, lying flat on my back. As I'm waking, I realize that I'm still talking. But once I became aware of my own talking, I couldn't remember what I was saying, or trying to say. I was fully awake then. I finished by lamely saying something like, they all died, the end. I looked around me at the girls who were all staring wide-eyed at me. A couple of the girls were quietly crying, mouths open in horror with tears streaming down their faces. My friend Lily whispered, that was the creepiest thing I've ever heard. The girls that weren't crying nodded in agreement. I said I was tired and that we should all go to bed. As all of the other girls moved away to their sleeping bags, I asked Lily and another girl, who I'll call Sarah, what I had said. I admitted to them that I had fallen asleep and I couldn't remember anything. Lily and Sarah exchanged glances, and Lily paused before saying, That just makes it worse. Sarah nodded in agreement and said that she didn't want to retell it because it was that creepy. Now, at this point, if it had just been Lily and one or two of the other girls that were in that group, I would have thought that they realized I was asleep and were just messing with me. But Sarah was, and still is, a very serious person who doesn't have much of a sense of humor, doesn't like pranks, even innocent ones, and is honest almost to a fault. So I went to sleep feeling unnerved but exhausted. A few hours later, I was being shaken awake by one of the adult camp leaders. She told me to gather my things and follow her. I sleepily and awkwardly carried my stuff down the ladder, then followed her outside. Two other camp leaders were standing next to a tent. They told me to put my items inside and then to come talk to them. Inside the tent were two of the younger girls, 12 or 13, that had been listening to the scary stories and who had been crying when I woke up. They wouldn't even look at me. They just laid there, sobbing. When I went back outside to talk to the leaders, they said that Lily had shown up at their tent with two of the sobbing girls. The girls were crying and kept saying they wanted their parents to come get them. Lily explained about the scary stories and about mine being the one that made them cry. The leaders asked me what I had said. I admitted that I had fallen asleep and honestly didn't know. The leader said that Lily refused to tell them what I said, and the two girls sobbed harder the more they tried to talk to them. They explained to the girls that they weren't going to call and wake their parents up at 3 a.m. and have them drive over an hour just because of spooky stories. Plus, we were all going home the next day. As punishment for scaring the girls, the leaders made me sleep in the tent with them while the leaders went to sleep in the longhouse. The girls cried for a bit and then we fell asleep. They were both gone from the tent when I awoke in the morning. To this day, I have no idea what story I told. Nobody that was there has ever been willing to tell me any of the details. Several years afterward, Lily told me that she would randomly still have nightmares because of it. The only details I ever had answered were that my voice sounded the same as usual, 
My eyes remained closed for the majority of the story, which creeped them out even more, and that the story was coherent and made sense up until the end when I lamely finished it off. Again, if it had only been Lily and a few other less serious girls, I would know that they were just screwing with me. But for Sarah and most of the other girls that were there, including the one that cried most of the night, being part of a prank on me just doesn't seem probable. I will likely never know the story that I told, and maybe it's for the best. So when I was about 13 or 14, I went camping with my father, my uncle, and my cousin. It was in a faraway place from home, and it was near a small fall that turned into a little river. Note that this was in Brazil, so we were camping in the deep depths of the rainforest. Very dark. After we had dinner, we put down the fire and went to sleep. It was my first time camping, so I was uncomfortable with all the forest noises and everything. After a good 30 or 40 minutes of trying to get to sleep, I realized that I wasn't hearing any noises anymore. It was completely silent, and my dad and relatives were sleeping. I was frightened because of the silence, so I stepped outside the tent to take a look outside with my flashlight, and then something kind of reflected the light. I was so scared that I went inside the tent again to find my dad and my relatives all wake up and ask if I saw something. I said that something reflected the light, and everyone stepped outside to see. When everybody was outside, we saw three gigantic figures, about seven feet high, fully covered in white clothes, gloves, and boots, and their faces were covered with something that looked like black nets. They had very long arms to the point of almost reaching the ground, and had a strange blue aura all over them that looked like fog. They made weird sounds as they were speaking with each other, at least I assume that's what they were doing, and then proceeded to just walk into the woods again. Everybody was so afraid that we just packed up and left that same night. I remember this like it was yesterday, and even now I am afraid to go camping again, I never want to have the possibility of encountering those things again. Also, I'm 25 years old now, so no, it wasn't drones. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a church that was over a hundred years old. It had been vacant for roughly 45 years. The church is attached to what once was a primary school, which had already been restored into office spaces. This was a no-brainer, since it was literally a couple of blocks away from my house, under the table, and the responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day, since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I would always see movement out of my peripheral vision, but nothing was there when I would look in that direction. This happened a lot, to the point where I had become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later, when the building became operational, as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I get a call from a tenant, saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed to the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlight and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got to the basement door, I could hear what sounded like power tools running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of a basement toward the noise. I find the cause of the noise, which was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure that I bled all the air before I left earlier that day, and I unplugged it. I looked to see if somebody had plugged it in after me, but it was still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight starts to flicker, and another unplugged power tool turns on behind me. 
When I turned around to shine my fading light at it, the light went out completely. I got out of that basement so fast, through complete darkness, toward the door. I get out and I see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks what was wrong, as I'm out of breath and clearly freaked out. I tell her what happened, and she smirks and says that that doesn't surprise her at all. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life and tells me that as a child she attended the school and church. She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it shut down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately took her own life because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where a coworker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked him what happened, he said that he felt like he was pushed. There were even times when the movement that I had always seen started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but still nothing there when I looked in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the night I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I would always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asks me if there were any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me that he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him that they were the only ones there and I began to lock up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps in the balcony, and I yelled out, Is anyone still here? I didn't get an answer, but at this point I was ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch is nowhere near the door, so you'd have to shut off the lights and then walk about 30 feet to the door in total darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted toward the door. As I reach for the door, I hear footsteps behind me, and a muffled voice say, leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside the church. I look up and I see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly looked down to ensure that I had locked the door. And by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure was now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got out of there. After that night, I made sure that I never entered that building after dark again. Needless to say, I quit shortly thereafter. My sister and I slept in the same bedroom. She's two years younger than me. Our beds were pretty much next to each other. Next to my sister's bed was a tall wardrobe. Not a spooky one, just a white box from Ikea. It was attached to the wall and filled with our old toys. One night, I woke up to my sister sitting on her bed, mumbling quietly. She's done this before but this time she was facing the wardrobe, so I only saw her back. I sat up quickly, remembering the previous time this had happened. I felt super uneasy. I didn't feel like somebody was in the room. I couldn't sense anything around us. I just felt scared. What I hadn't realized immediately was that my sister wasn't just facing the wardrobe, but the door was actually open. Not just a little bit, like I took something during the day and didn't notice that I left it open a crack, but it had been clearly opened during the night. We never go to that wardrobe since there's just a ton of old toys in there, nothing that we actually need. Instead of asking who she was talking to or what she was talking about, I decided to just listen, or maybe I was too afraid to ask. I honestly can't remember. 
At first I only heard mumbling, and I couldn't make out anything. But then I heard her clearly ask, What did you want to tell me? While looking into the wardrobe. And when I shifted a little bit in my bed to look, that's when I got this overwhelming feeling of someone being in the room with us. I called my sister's name and I noticed her stiffening from hearing my voice, but she didn't turn around to face me before quietly mumbling, I have to go, and closing the door of the closet. After that, she seemed way sleepier, way less aware of her surroundings, like she was still asleep. But the way that she just spoke a little bit earlier and closed the door was like a completely coherent person. She seemed to be fully awake, not like she was still asleep. She fell asleep right after I told her to lay her head on the pillow and get some sleep. And once again, like the last time, she couldn't remember any of this the next morning. After the previous time, the feeling of the unsafe and dark presence disappeared. But after this time, it stayed. Every day, in every room, it felt like someone was looking at you or sitting in the shadows. It sounds spooky, but it felt even spookier. I feel like usually home is your safe place, but during that time, it felt like everything but safe and cozy. My mom experienced super vivid bad dreams. Never before had she believed us, or in any sort of presences or ghosts. Or had she ever been spooked out by those things? I struggled with severe insomnia. But my little sister? She slept like a baby. Around a month after the wardrobe incident, I woke up again to the same setting. And this time I just started crying immediately from how freaked out I was. My sister was once again sitting on her bed, facing the wardrobe with her back turned towards me. This time the door was closed but she was tapping the same door with her fingernail. Not once or twice, but continuously, while mumbling quietly. This time I immediately told her to stop and get back to bed. She put her hand down and kept mumbling, but kept facing the wardrobe. I called her name calmly again for a couple of times before she finally turned to me with her eyes closed and said, I can't do it. I asked what she couldn't do, but then she just laid down and fell asleep. After this night, the bad energy or presence I had felt disappeared, and slowly my mom's nightmares and my insomnia left too. I still don't know what the heck was going on, but honestly, I'm just glad it stopped. I moved out about a year after that, and now my sister has her own room, so there's no telling if stuff like this keeps happening or not. But there are still times when I visit my mom's place and feel the same feeling of unsafe, especially during the night. This was a couple of months ago. I was staying the night at my significant other's house. We were laying in bed, watching TV. Her two daughters, ages five and eight, came into the room. The five-year-old was leaning against my side of the bed and looking over my chest toward her mother, whose side of the bed is near the wall. Who's that lady? The five-year-old says. Me, thinking she was being silly and talking about her mom, said, that's your mommy. The five-year-old says, no, not her, the lady behind her. She was staring at the wall, looking at eye level, about where a person's eyes would be if they were standing there. Gave me the chills. My significant other who was chatting with her other daughter didn't hear this exchange. Later, when I told her, she got freaked out and told me that she was pretty certain her house was haunted. Apparently, she's had all kinds of things happen. Now, when I go over there, I get a little paranoid and I get an eerie feeling. I'm not sure if it's because of anything actually supernatural, or if I just expect it to be haunted because she's told me those things, regardless of whether it's true or not, you know? The only other things I've experienced have been lights randomly turning on, and my glasses disappearing from where I definitely left them. Haven't seen them since, actually. I had to get new ones. 
The whole deal with the five-year-old really freaked me out, though. I still have no idea what she was looking at. My little sister was around, I want to say like six, maybe seven, when she started talking about her imaginary friend, the Red Man. She explained to me that he was a magician with a magic finger. I didn't think too much into it. We were homeschooled, and she was incredibly bored before her friends got home. So I assumed that's all it was. One day she comes running into my room, very upset and frantic. She told me, I took his finger and now he's really angry. I tried to calm her down, again assuming that this was just a six-year-old's imagination. But she was convinced that he was coming after her, and for a few nights I let her sleep in my bed. She stopped talking about it for a few days and acted fine. And then I was doing dishes with our brother, who's about two years older. He was never the type to have imaginary friends. He didn't pretend like that at all. Very analytical. So when he asked my sister if she'd seen the Red Man lately, I was a little shocked. Apparently he knew all about it too, and was just as convinced as our sister that it was real. So I asked him, and he said that they'd been playing with the Red Man and she accidentally took his finger. I was starting to get very unsettled by all of this. My sister drew pictures of him all the time. Sometimes he would look like a person, other times he looked more like a mist. The last straw was the evening that she and I were outside late. My parents had brought a big load of groceries in. Suddenly she stiffens up and points. He's right there, she said. I turned around to where she was pointing. Across the street, under a large tree, was an unsettling sight. A tall man thing. He was very red, and I felt total dread looking at it. My parents were very religious at the time, and they had heard all about the situation, and had my sister see the priest at our church, and it all seemed to stop. I didn't think about it for a long time, until a few months ago, when my sister came to visit me at my house. She's 13 now. We were sitting outside and talking, when, very casually, she said, do you think the red man still wants his finger back? I'll never know if she said that to mess with me or if something very strange is haunting my baby sister, but it spooks me nonetheless. I was 14, and I was having a sleepover at my friend Jake's house. His parents weren't going to be home until about 1.30 or 2, so it was nice for them to let me hang out with him. Jake's little brother Aiden was probably six years old, maybe five. I don't remember the exact details, but I do remember what happened. Jake put his brother to bed early in the evening, and he slept pretty well until about 11. We both hear Aiden calling to Jake from his own room down the hall, so Jake handed me the controller to continue playing. A couple of minutes later, Jake comes back and says, That was freaking weird. I asked him what was up, and he told me that Aiden apparently woke up and saw a man in his closet with his back facing to him. Jake checked the closet, found nobody, closed the door, and brushed it off as Aiden having a nightmare. He plugged in the nightlight for him and then came back. It was definitely eerie, but it got worse. At about 12.30, we both heard Aiden screaming for Jake. I knew it was probably a nightmare, but because of what he said previously, I decided to go with Jake to check on him. Jake ended up taking a few minutes to calm him down, and when he finally did, Aiden said, The man in the closet came out. He had no eyes, and then he tried to get in the bed with me. That was freaky enough, but to make everything even scarier, I noticed something. 
Aiden's closet door was ajar a couple of inches, and I remember that it was completely shut, because not long after the first encounter, I had passed by his bedroom to use the bathroom and peered in just out of curiosity. I remember that the closet was completely closed, because I actually looked for it, because of what he had told Jake. I don't think any of us got a wink of sleep that night. Maybe Aiden opened the closet door or sleepwalked or something, but he's never done that before or since. It really spooked us all. Aiden ended up sleeping in his parents' room that night, and I remember not coming over too much after that. This has been several years back. I had to have been maybe 16 or 17 at the time. It was a Thursday, and I was in the pastor's office, working on a lesson for one of the classes. The church was a decent size. When you first walk into the foyer, you have stairs up to your right that go down into the basement, and stairs in front that bring you to the sanctuary. From the sanctuary, you have a door on the right that leads to a ramp, which brings you to a hallway. That hallway has a ramp that goes into the basement and library. On past the ramp is the nursery, a classroom, and the office on the right. Then on the left is another hallway that leads to the bathrooms, classrooms, and the gym. I'm in the office, and I hear a thud coming from the sanctuary. Confused, I look out the window and see no other cars than mine. I figured maybe the pastor walked over to grab something or check on something. I called him and asked him if he was in the church. He explained that he and his wife were in one of the Carolinas. I asked about the deacons, and most were home or out of state. Plus, most will ring the doorbell to warn me that they're there. With the phone call confirming that I should be alone, I go out to check the noise. I get to the ramp that goes to the sanctuary, and I hear footsteps running down the ramp toward me. I couldn't see what it was. I could only hear it. I bailed and I shut myself in the office until I felt safe again. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot, and I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice-sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs, and I start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking and dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away, and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. Thinking nothing of it, I go to bed after eating my food, douse the fire, and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decided that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I couldn't quite go to sleep. So I pulled out a book that I brought with me and started to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by, and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down, and I listen to this animal walk-drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after. It's almost like the deer is dragging something along. 
It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and I try not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right and then women's laughter and sticks snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is real or just a product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughter from a couple other different directions. All different kinds of people, old men, old women, even children. And I confirm that yes, this is real. The noises are closing in and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot in the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing. The forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I scared off whoever it was, I sat down in my exhausted state and I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety. It was still dark out. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I got up and sprinted out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the whole way. I never heard anybody follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way. But I still couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that night. Even though this happened a long time ago, my memory of this event is very crisp. I remember it extremely vividly, just because of how odd and traumatic it was. A couple of years ago, my family, which consisted of my dad, my mom, my little brother, my uncle and aunt, and their two children, as well as my other uncle and his wife, were at church on a Sunday afternoon. It was just a regular Sunday mass, not anything special. What I remember happening was that all of a sudden we left in the middle of the service. We were walking out and going to the parking lot, and I remember that my aunt was hysterical. She was crying and hugging my dad. My dad was almost in tears as well. I was around seven at the time, so I was really just puzzled and confused. But eventually I forgot about it and went on with my day. Years pass and the topic comes up at a family gathering. What really happened that day still creeps me out, and how my family just talks about it now, as if it wasn't such a weird thing to have experienced, is totally beyond me. Anyway, on that Sunday, my family was leaning on one of the walls of the building, facing the priest who was giving a lecture. It was really busy that day, and there weren't any seats left. About 30 minutes into Mass, my aunt notices a guy who looks almost identical to my deceased uncle in the crowd. 
She is stunned and elbows my dad to show him what she's looking at. The man she was pointing at was fortunate enough to have gotten a seat, and he was in one of the rows on a bench, just sitting there. As my dad is staring at this guy, he's puzzled and in complete shock. The guy looks up at my dad, makes eye contact, and smiles. And then he just looks back at the priest who's giving the lecture. My dad freaks out, and so does my aunt, who noticed that the guy was an exact copy of my deceased uncle. The guy all of a sudden gets up, excuses himself from the people that he has to cross in front of in order to get out, and walks out and exit. As soon as he does, my other uncle walks on after him in an attempt to catch up and apologize for creeping him out. My uncle claims he followed him up to the exit where he turned a corner and completely lost him out of sight. Now, that's already weird, but my uncle also claims that he noticed a scar on the man's left forearm that he knew for a fact my deceased uncle had. It happened in a firework accident when he was little. Ever since then, they never saw the guy again. Some family members of ours have claimed that they've seen somebody who looks exactly like my dead uncle, but who knows if it's the same guy they saw that day. Maybe it was just some random dude, or maybe it was my uncle's last attempt at saying goodbye to his siblings. Who really knows? Either way, it's a story I'll never forget. Years ago, we used to babysit my baby cousins. One day, we were trying to get Vivian ready to go home, and we couldn't get her to focus on getting her coat on. She kept turning to look at the front door. Exasperated, my mom asked her why she was staring at the door. Vivian answers, I want to wave by at the man's. Why they dress like Halloween? I wave at them. And then she waved at our front door before saying, they gone now. Still creeps me out thinking about it. I had just found out that I was pregnant and twins run in my family so I was excited for my first ultrasound that was a couple of weeks away. My neighbor's five-year-old grandson was visiting her and we all took a walk together around the neighborhood. She told him that I was going to have a baby and he replied, no, she's not. She told him again that there was a baby in my tummy and that we were going to check soon whether there were one or two. He stopped walking, looked at my belly and said, no, there's zero. Then he continued on walking with us, chatting about bugs and kid stuff. I miscarried about a week later. Somehow, that kid knew. I'm first off, I'm currently 51 years old, and this still bothers me to this day. I have quite a few stories throughout my life to share, but this is the first. I was living in a new state, which I had never been to before. This was in the era where our parents told us to go out and play and be back at dinner time. I was nine years old in 1979, and we had just moved to Dallas, Texas. I was playing outside by myself, and I was approached by another young girl. She seemed normal and asked to play with me. I was okay with it. She asked if I wanted to see her playroom. I didn't see any reason not to, and I followed her. Mind you, we lived in a townhouse that looked like row houses, so we went into her townhouse, and I never saw anyone in the house, just the two of us. The townhouse looked normal enough, we went upstairs and into a bedroom that looked like a little girl's room. She walked up to the wall and pushed a panel, which opened. She crawled in and, stupid me, I followed. 
Inside was this amazing room full of toys and a little black kitten she was holding. I was so taken by all that was in front of me, and I was just excited to play. We played for a bit. However, in the secret room, there were no windows or natural lighting. I couldn't tell what time it was. Eventually, I felt uncomfortable, like I needed to get home. So I told her I had to go. Mind you, never once asking for her name or telling her mine. But she turned to me with dark eyes and asked me by name if I really wanted to go because it was fun here in the room. I was creeped out because I know I didn't tell her my name. I crawled out and she followed me. I just kept moving down the stairs to the door, trying to avoid looking back. But once I opened the door, I did look back. And to me, she looked like part girl and part skeleton. So I ran home as it was dusk and I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't say anything about it to my mom. I went about my evening and slept like normal. But the next day, I was disturbed by it and I decided to go back and see if she was still there. When I walked down to the town home, it was boarded up like there'd been a fire there. I stood back and looked at it for a while, knowing that I had been in there yesterday and it looked normal. I never saw or heard anything about that little girl again. I wish I had told someone who could have found out if she ever lived there. To this day, I can see that hidden playroom like it was yesterday, and I have no explanation. I will never forget these two paranormal experiences that I had at church when I was 14. When I was 14, I went to a church gathering on Halloween night that was called Hallelujah Night. It was a Christian alternative to Halloween. My family and I would get there in the afternoon since we would volunteer to help set up the booths, cakewalk, candy barrels, etc. But I was mostly there to get first dibs on all the candy. After I finished helping with the usual booth setup, I took a seat on the bench near the main sanctuary. It was my favorite place to sit, since I could see the entire lot and, most of all, the beautiful sunset. I pulled out my PSP and was just scrolling through some music that I had on it when some guy approached me and started a conversation. I've never been a people person, so usually when things like this happen, I keep the conversation short. However, this guy had this weird kind of warmth to him, as if he was a friend of mine. As the conversation carried on, I started to ask him if he was new, because I hadn't seen him before. He told me that he'd been going to this church for years, but left after an incident happened. When I asked him about the incident, he paused, looked at me, and said that there were some things people pick up on that they know aren't normal and that you should never get curious about things that you know you should leave alone. I sort of had a confused look on my face since I didn't know what he meant at the time. The guy noticed it and said that I would understand once I got older. I looked down at the PSP that I still had in my hands, and when I looked up right away, the guy was gone. I looked around and I couldn't find him anywhere in the lot. There were just a few people still prepping for Hallelujah Night. It didn't make any sense. Fast forward to a few months later, I was sitting in the main sanctuary before leaving to do my usual volunteer work on the upper floor of the main sanctuary. The upper floor was a daycare area for kids, so at the end of service, volunteers would escort the children downstairs and I would go into each room shutting off the lights and making sure that no children were still up there. I'll never forget getting up to leave to do my usual duties when the pastor started talking about an upcoming funeral, I looked at the big screens on each side of the main sanctuary, and the face of the one man that I had been talking to during Hallelujah Night setup was there. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. To this day, it still seems unreal. I was beyond shaken as I made my way out of the main sanctuary and to the flights of big stairs as I went up to the upper floor. Once I made it up to the upper floor, Another volunteer had confirmed that all the children were escorted downstairs. 
She noticed that I had a sort of pale look from seeing what I had seen in the main sanctuary and asked me if I was okay. I told her that it was nothing and I proceeded to cut off all the lights on the upper floor as she left downstairs. The upper floor was like a giant hallway with doors on each side and a door at the end of the hallway with a giant window in it. When I came to the last room at the end of the hall, I would always leave the blinds on that big window open since the light always illuminated the dark hallway and made me feel less scared. But as I left the room, I remember feeling panicked. It started freezing, and I felt like if I left that room, something would be waiting for me in the darkened rooms that was going to jump out and attack me. As I'm trying to muster up the courage to just run for it, I see a small head of a child peek out a couple of doors down. It stayed there for a few seconds, then put its head back in the room. I immediately called out to the child, but got no answer. The fear that I had had a minute ago was gone as I left the last room to go through the illuminated hallway. I made it to the other room in a matter of seconds, turning on the lights and searching the entire room for the child I saw, but no one was there. I started getting spooked again as I turned all the lights off in that room. As I was leaving the room, I looked back at the last room's window, which illuminated the hallway, and out of nowhere, a massive black mass moved in front of the window, almost covering the light completely. It was darker than dark, and its outline covered the light and seemed to be moving. It was enough to scare me to run for my life. I ran the rest of the hallway and down the stairs. I was stopped by one of the ushers who told me not to run, but when I told him what I had seen, he looked at me like I was crazy. Once church was over, I told my parents about what happened on the ride home. They ended up not believing me, but I know what I saw that day, and the man who was apparently dead had warned me of something for a reason. Either way, those two events still scare me to this very day. My nephew didn't say this to me personally, but he did to my sister, repeatedly, for about a month. At the time, he was about five years old. Every single morning, he would ask my sister why the lady with blood on her tries to make him take her hand at night and come with her. He would tell her to leave him alone and cry, and she would say, shh, 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 shh like a mother comforting her child, all whilst holding her hand out and asking him to come with her. Freaks the hell out of all of us. 